Hello, Meg. Hey, Hello. Bhakti. Good to see you. Yes. So welcome, everyone, to the season finale of the Radical Books Collective. We've had a fantastic eight months or so, I think, uh, of doing this. And this is our second big event. The first one was on African speculative fiction. Uh, and today we are celebrating uh, cookbooks, food, food politics. My name is Bhakti Shungarpure, and I'm the creative director for RBC. Uh, and Meg, do you want to say quickly uh, a quick hello? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Meg Ehrenberg. I'm the managing director of the Radical Books Collective, and I'm super excited about this gastropolitics, gastropoetics event celebrating cookbooks. Um, I just thought we could, you know, give a little sense of where we're coming from with this event um, and the questions that we're starting with. Um, basically, can can a cookbook be a radical book? And mm -hmm. can we understand archiving, translating, writing, teaching recipes as radical practices? Um, so, you know, these questions might be a little surprising for, for some folks here in the U.S. where uh, we're in this extraordinarily long holiday season uh and <laughs> and i feel like this time of year you always see like the displays in bookstores of you know piles of cookbooks the the visuals of abundance and it's like you know glossy photos um mm -hmm. you know sumptuous ingredients and fancy kitchens and this kind of thing um and and i think we're we're coming from a different idea of what what's possible with with the cookbook yeah Absolutely. Um, and I think while there's that visual uh, feasting and so on, I think today we are going to talk to a number of cooks and chefs, cookbook authors, uh, experts uh, on food, food ways, food studies. Um, and uh, they're all doing something more than creating flashy coffee table objects. These are also educators. These are uh, you know, writers who see the transformative potential in tracing uh, practices, rituals, and stories around food and connecting them to long histories and visions of the future. I think uh, when we started out, uh, you know, we were also looking at uh, books like Decolonize Your Diet, uh, this amazing book by Sean Sherman, The Sous Chef's Indigenous Kitchen. Um, and I think what the idea here was in what ways do such books recuperate history? And they point out erasure, historical erasures, and food is a way uh, to kind of do that. I think as the program evolved, though, uh, it seems inadvertently, we have assembled a group of people who are speaking about migration and displacement. We will have a focus on Afghanistan, uh, also a person who will talk about uh, growing up uh, as a Somali refugee, um, so I think consciously or unconsciously, uh, these radical and recuperative impulses that we will see uh, will tend to get focused, I think, on uh, migration is my sense. And I, I would just add that, you know, of course, there are a lot of other texts out there, a lot of cookbooks that are doing this kind of work. And obviously, we would have loved to have you know, 10 more <laughs> authors with us today. But, you know, I would just point out that we do have a longer list, a kind of bibliography of, of texts that we recommend. Um, and we even have links to those in our bookshop page uh, mm -hmm. where people can go ahead and purchase copies. So there is there is a list out there of, you know, radical, right. radical cookbooks that we recommend. Right, right. Uh, and before we start, I think this is the time for me to admit that I have some sort of a book hoarding uh, uh, problem here. Uh, these are these are the radical cookbooks I found. A lot of them are interlinked publishing. They do, you know, they focus a lot on Syria and displacement. Uh, this one, one of my favorites. It's also like a, like almost like a theoretical work, anthropological work. The Gaza Kitchen. Uh, there's Pierre Pierre Thiam uh, and Yolele, uh, and then of course there is. Um, you know, the books that we're featuring today, you know, uh, and I happen to uh, own all of them, lucky me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's not always, uh, I think it's very easy to confuse radical potential of food. Like I also have a lot of uh, terrible cookbooks. Like I have this guy who uses the word revolution, not revolutionary at all, totally corporate, <laughs> ha corporate <laughs> hound. Uh, and then uh, when I was in Kenya, I discovered uh, uh, I found 
really in, in a pile of books at a, at a hotel, at an Airbnb, uh, this book called Cooking with an African Flavor. And it's, uh, it, I was just shocked at how, how racist it was. Mm. Uh, you know, it has all these kind of animal depictions because it's, uh, you know, Africa and all this, um, you know, super problematic illustrations and the recipes themselves are just absolutely awful, claiming a kind of African cuisine, uh, which right. is so problematic. But uh, anyway, I guess part of that motivates us to do. No, I was just going to say, you know, it speaks to what what these authors that we're speaking with today are intervening in, um, you know, yeah. beyond just like creating a whole event for you to to uh, display your incredible archive of uh, of cookbooks. Yeah. 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 So should we start off? Yeah. Let's do it. I think we have uh, Kareem Atrawi and Nahid Kazemi, who are here to talk about their their delightful cookbook, uh, Arab Fairy Tale Feasts, which is one that I actually do. Ha I don't have as many as Bhakti, but I do have this one. Um, okay. And and here to talk with them about it is uh, Marsha Lynx Quayley. All right. All right. Thank you guys. Thanks, Meg and Bhakti, for organizing this fantastic Friday panel. I am so excited to be talking to the author and illustrator of one of my favorite books of 2021, Arab Fairy Tale Feasts, which was also not just an experience for me, but a shared experience with my 10 year old as he and I read it separately, but we made at least a dozen of the recipes together. And then also further, we're able to share them with family and friends. And I wanna sort of highlight one of the reasons why I feel this is so important is not just because there are so few uh, cookbooks in this space, this middle grade tween space. Um, there's, you know, cookbooks for teens and cookbooks for small children, but almost none for this eight to 12 age group. Um, but also that I have kind of almost no knowledge of how to, uh, no framework for how to pass on my cooking knowledge. Uh, which I didn't get any from my mother, and I doubt I don't know how she learned to cook either. How to pass that knowledge on to onto my kids? Um, so, by way of introduction to this um, conversation, I, I agree that I think we vastly underestimate the cultural importance of cookbooks, which are often seen as a kind of frivolity, but have a very wide and often undocumented impact on culture, power, health, and pleasure. And to me, this came into focus because uh, in the mid 20th century, my grandmother, the daughter of Swedish cook, settler colonists was a door to door home economist tasked with selling a sort of scientific approach to cooking um, that was divorced from cultural, ecological or flavor contexts, and of course on Sioux and Ojibwe land. Um, from, but her experience is not a unique Egyptian writer, Salma Seri also has documented that her grandmother, a home economist in Egypt, um, has did something similar and both of them are rooted in cookbooks in a sort of you know very non-radical cookbooks that changed the landscape but that did change the landscape of food and people's interactions with food even for people who didn't read them which is not to say that food should stay the same as arab fairy tale feasts really particularly highlights ingredients and dishes have always moved around much like folk tales but instead of being divorced from context um, folk tales and foods were adapted into new cultures and contexts. One of uh, my favorite examples is uh, is kushiri, which there's for which there's a recipe in this book um, in Arab fairy tale feasts. Um, this dish is not like, say, fisik, which supposedly comes from the pharaonic times, but is a relatively recent import into Egypt, even though it's you know now considered sort of a national dish. And I was hoping for a definitive answer about the origins of Kushiri, did not find one, but certainly mid 19th century came somehow from foreign workers. Um, so I, just before I introduce Kareem and Haid, I want to say that also a thank you to Subhi and Tamem Zobedi, who were um, chefs and restaurateurs, who also helped Kareem uh, crafting the recipes for this book. So huge welcome to Kareem Rawi, who was born in Alexandria, Egypt. He went to school in England and after graduation worked as a writer at several theatres, including Royal Court Theatre and Theatre Royal Stratford East. Returning to Egypt, he taught at the theatre department of the AUC, wrote four stage plays in Arabic that were produced on the Egyptian stage. His first novel, Book of Sands, won the inaugural HarperCollins UBC Prize for Best New Fiction 
He's author of several picture books for children, including The Mouse Who Saved Egypt and The Girl Who Lost Her Smile. And he joins us from Vancouver. Nahid uh, Kazemi is author, illustrator, and visual artist. After studying painting at Art University in Tehran, she worked as a graphic designer for literary magazines, published children's books in Iran, participated in illustration festivals and painting exhibitions around the world. She's published her books in Iran, the US, Canada, and Europe. She was a finalist for the Governor General Prize in 2018 in Canada, nominated for Ostrid Lindgren in 2020, and numerous other awards that we have no time to list. Um, so, Kareem, I wanted to talk, start to ask you how this came about, why you wanted to take on this book, and how you balance sort of the traditional recipes and traditional um, stories and and traditional tales and the innovations in recipes and the innovations in, in the stories that you, you know, changed and adapted. Well, um, well hello everybody. Um, that's, uh, uh, well, really the first thing to say is that um, a book is, is produced by many, by a team. It's, it's, it's not a, a really, and especially a book like this is not a one person um, effort, and um, you know, I'm, I'm very gra grateful <coughs> to Nehid for um, doing such beautiful illustrations for the book. And um, really, there's a, a whole lot of people I should be thanking, um, including Leila, who edited the recipes, and um, uh, Carol Frank, who um, worked uh, on the um, on the book design and I mean just quite a few other people aside from of course um, Tamam and, uh, and Subhi. The, the, the way the book came about was basically me being, <coughs> me being approached by, um, uh, by a publisher in Canada and um, uh, being asked if I was interested in supplying the stories for the um, uh, cookbook. Uh, gradually uh, in, uh, it's through a series of conversations, the project grew and I ended up doing all the writing. Um, but that wasn't the original plan. And um, uh, the contributions by, uh, by the others has really been um, uh, quite precious to, to, to the project. The, I think the reason I ended up doing so much was because really... Uh, you need to focus a work like this needs to be focused in some way and it's it's easier if it's just one person who's um, processing and focusing it and so um, my idea was very much about how cultures are I mean we stand on each other's shoulders if you like <laughs> that cultures build on take the best or, or take take from each other and give to each other and it's that process of exchange that um, I, I feel is often missed uh, when people write about cultures. And I thought that a, a cookbook would be a, a perfect uh, way of illustrating that. I don't Excellent. know if that yeah, your yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> then the second part of the question, how did you balance the traditional in the, the sort of, you know, for instance, you know, um, in the recipes and in the stories, you have the uh, Guha character and some other traditional elements, but also, you, ch you know, innovations as well. Is that also part of, um, you know, the sort of movement and up constant updating of things? Yes, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's quite wrong to think of cultures as frozen entities. I, I think cultures evolve. And um, therefore, I, I didn't want to rework existing stories. I wanted to create new stories that were modeled on a uh, genre that, that already existed. So that, so that was, in a sense, contributing to to genre that already existed, which I, 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 I talk about a little in the introduction and, um, and, at the, uh, and, the, and the postscript in the book. And so the, it, it was something similar with the recipes. It was... Uh, one of the big challenges was finding recipes that you could really involve children in, in the kitchen or young people in the kitchen. And um, a lot of the recipes that uh, 
we use in the Middle East are, uh, well, it, 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 the, the kitchen becomes a center for, for social events in a way. Um, people start cooking for, for dinner uh, um, in mid-morning quite often. I mean, traditionally. I mean, obviously nowadays with the kind of uh, uh, life that most people live in the cities, it's not quite like that. But still, in many cases it is. Uh, you start quite early. Um, you involve the children. You involve everybody in the family. Um, people go out and do the shopping while you're preparing something and you decide you need more of, of, some, of something and less of something else. And it becomes a, an, an event. Um, and that really, although that's, that's truthful to the situation there, it really wouldn't work for a cookbook like this. The cookbook needed to be something that could be done and the results ready within a, um, in a timely manner. So one of the challenges really was to, was to adapt the, the recipes. And that was really a, a, a major issue. Um, and um, I, I think we've, we've achieved that. And I, and I think that that's, that's one of the accomplishments of the book is that um, none of the recipes are, are too complicated. And they all, I think, flavor-wise, are pretty close to, to, to the traditional yeah, I, I, I mean, I, so I, I've involved my, my son, for instance, my 10 year old before in shelling the chickpeas, but I never, this is the first time he's been the whole part of the hummus process, you know? So this recipe sort of gave him the, not just to, to be a small cog in the, in the process, but to, to be participate in the whole thing. So, yes, Nahid, so that, oh, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say that, that, well, that was, I'm glad to hear that because that was precisely the intention was to to provide something for also for a range of um, ages um, mm. that that would be uh, uh, that, that would permit involvement and and enjoyment uh, and there's nothing there's nothing more enjoy, enjoyable I think than being a part of the process of producing a food that you like to eat so uh, yeah. Yeah, and there's nothing, nothing, no better way to get kids to try. I mean, you know, from our situation, most of these dishes are familiar, but but there's no better way to get kids to try a new dish than to involve them in making it. I think. Exactly. Yes. So, Nahida, I wanted to say so that um, my son Rafael and I love the illustrations, and in most of the cookbooks for kids that that I've had, there are photos of the food which I think sort of sets up some sort of correct results, like you're gonna be graded on it later, did you do the recipe right? But in this, um, in this book, instead we get um, illustrations of the food. And I'm sorry, I don't have a back copy, but I want people yeah. to just see, oh, the illustrations of the food. Um, and I wondered, as you were making the illustrations for the recipe pages, what information did you want the food images to convey and how did you decide what to put in and what to leave out on those recipe pages. Hello, everyone. Um, before drawing, um, I had to uh, have a, res uh, a kind of uh, anthropological and cultural research about uh, um, Arab fo Arabic foods, uh, culture, people, how they live, their home, their house, but. Uh, the stories um, time happened in ancient mostly most of them and some of them even been kind of legend style uh, uh, so uh, for me um, i liked uh, working on this book because it was a combination of a story and food and i try to give them a kind of humor too because story and food are two i think a bill of things for human beings you know when we want to um uh, actually have a good time together we gather around a table to eat something together and it's uh, like uh, food uh, brings peace and happiness for us uh, about your question regarding your question yeah, I um, I believe if I wasn't an artist, I should have been a chef. Uh, so all the recipes were interesting to me. I read them. Uh, uh, I used to read them carefully, and uh, 
um, I used to think about uh, which part can be uh, interesting for a kid and uh, when I want to draw it, uh, how should I draw it uh, that to be um, to be actually to inspire a kid, you know, to make her curious to know more about the food, more about the tale, uh, and to encourage them to continue to read and to um, make them actually to encourage them to know about food or even know about how to draw, how to um, paint. Uh, food stuff or ingredient or um, but uh, I had some other limits too um, uh, for example um, most of the ingredients and most of the recipes if I wanted to uh, draw all of them it wasn't possible I should to uh, I should actually to consider um, the graphic design of the book as well uh, so uh, sometimes uh, I have to choose, for example, I have to compare the recipes together and uh, I, have, I had to um, choose which one, for example, if I had some ingredients and have some drawing for one recipe, I um, tried to, uh, to uh, draw the other stuff for other recipes and uh, I, uh, I was trying to actually um, uh, not to repeat uh, for example one thing one stuff for in um, a few recipes and i had to um, consider the, the, the limits of graphic design too sorry today i have a con uh, you know actually my neighbor has a construction and i'm afraid it interrupts us but <laughs> that's okay um so, uh, Karim, you, uh, the stories come from across the Arab majority countries. There's a story set here in Morocco, uh, there's stories set in the Gulf, and you, so there's definitely a diversity of settings. And I wondered what other considerations came into play when you thought about balancing this as a collection? Yeah. Hmm. Now that's a question. Um, Yes, I, I, I very much wanted to um, have a selection of recipes from across the region. And that's because uh, I believe the region is a very diverse region. Um, it's, it's a region that's, that's a region because, because everybody there shares a common language. But um, historically and culturally, there are roots that go back a very, very long time in different parts. It's um, it, um, a country like Egypt. Uh, well, I mean, the, there were pharaohs building temples 3,000 years BC. Um, uh, that's, you know, I mean, 5,000 years of, of roots, if you like. Um, but also the same goes for Iraq, the same goes for Syria, the same goes for um, for Morocco, Algeria, um, Tunisia, uh, you can you can find those those um, uh, deep historical roots where different peoples settled and gradually over a period of uh, several thousand years, uh, cultures I wouldn't say merged, but cultures interact interacted and. Um, a common language developed, and so so I wanted to to show that diversity in the selection of foods as well as in the selection of stories. Um, so I, so yes, there's, there are stories that are based in in different countries, partly to reflect that. Um, but then, so other, so the same goes for the recipes. Um, the, we avoided recipes that were very specific to specific countries. Um, I was very keen on having a recipe for tagine, which is uh, a North African dish that I'm very fond of. <laughs> um, 
and um, it involves uh, quite often it's 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 meat cooked with with fruit, um, uh, with uh, apricots um, in particular. Uh, chicken with apricots is is is, is my favorite tagine, but um, it, it's it's a recipe that requires time and and it, it requires a lot of time uh, to do properly. It's slow cooking. Um, and so it, it wasn't appropriate for that reason, um, given that we were trying to reach a readership that involved uh, young people. So it was finding that balance, really, that uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the hummus you, you, you mentioned, well, we, it, that's very much a Lebanese-Syrian type hummus where, uh, you, uh, where yogurt is added to it. Um, in Egypt, you almost never, uh, well, you would never have that, or very rarely. Uh, I, I haven't actually had that myself there in, uh, in Egypt. So it's a, it was a question of really uh, finding a way of uh, making the recipes and the stories re reflect uh, the cultures of these different countries. Excellent. Excellent. So, so, like, I'm, I'm echoing. echoing I um, uh, you mentioned before the research that you did, and one of one of the favorite our, our favorite illustrations was the little girl at the end of Fish Soup for Reza, the, the little girl sticking out her tongue. We absolutely love her, and I and and it does range across sort of different areas and different um, sort of aesthetic you know, styles. Like the the king is is rendered differently from the merchants. Um, and I wondered what kind of research you put into it. Yeah, I love this girl. <laughs> what kind of research you put into it and how you balance that with, um, you know, just your, uh, your own invention. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, first of all, uh, it was very different. This book was very different with uh, um, other projects that uh, I was working at the time. Uh, before drawing, as I said, I did some uh, cultural and uh, anthropological uh, research because I needed them to, um, to understand uh, deeper the stories. And I didn't, and I needed them to, to uh, find the the deep level of their stories and to uh, but I try to um, um, make them a kind of a comic illustration to uh, close them to comic illustration and I consider the humor part of their stories I try to to discover the humor level of their stories the humor part of their stories because I think it's the part that makes uh, actually uh, book more interesting for kids, you know, even for uh, for all of us, for adults too, uh, we are uh, all uh, likes uh, humor part of stories, humor part of even uh, daily life, you know, and we are all uh, interested in jokes, interested in humor and stuff. So I try to. Uh, actually take advantage of this ability uh, and this uh, uh, um, this ability, this um, competence for uh, for my uh, illustrations uh, but uh, the time of the stories was very old you know they uh, happened in ancient and I couldn't find that much references uh, I just could uh, um, use my own uh, imagination, uh, but uh, I just uh, try to uh, um, to find more about, for example, uh, Arabic clothes uh, or uh, decoration or uh, uh, for example, um, in ancient. Um, for example, um, even the food, even their um, 
uh, vessels, everything, you know, the stuff they, uh, they used in ancient, uh, um, the references wasn't that, weren't that much, but I could just use my own imagination and uh, I could uh, connect uh, with the stories. Um, and it's the result. And I'm glad, I'm glad that you are uh, saying that your son, you are saying that your son liked them. It's yeah, for me. Yeah, and there was a great interplay between the humor of the stories, right? Because a lot of them are mischievous girls or the clever widow or, um, uh, and, and they, they take a, a turn at the end and the humor and the fun of the illustrations. So you're muted to no other books because um, um, actually I, I bought more than uh, 60 children pic uh, picture books and none of them are the same but and this one was very different with others uh, it was the style that uh, uh, I thought uh, suits to this uh, um, kind of uh, humor the story uh, um, for my other projects, I bought, uh, for example, I make a book from one story and it's very different. Uh, but for this one, uh, it was like chapter, chapter, and every chapter has a has an independent story uh, and their style was different together. So I tried to just, uh, you know, the things that uh, I tried to keep all over the book is uh, a humoric and comic part of the stories. And uh, it's uh, the things that uh, um, I think uh, maybe, maybe kids uh, like some more than um, other part of this. But I try to make it colorful. Color is the things that Mm. Uh, make a book uh, um, uh, more interesting and uh, mm, it's food you know f as a as an illustrator food is a material full of uh, uh, visual elements and colors different colors so for me it was uh, an amazing project to work excellent so Karim sorry to go back to Hamas yet again <laughs> um, because it because it is such a sort of a a cultural uh, flashpoint issue, you know, not just because of sort of in terms of cultural appropriation by Israel, but also the way in which it's sort of divorced from context, put into these horrible plastic tubs in the supermarket, and add all kinds of uh, you know disgusting, unpalatable flavors. And I really appreciated how your hummus was specific culture, you know, specific culturally. Um, uh, it, you know, uh, a Lebanese or, or Shemi hummus. Um, and then, but I was interested that the story that it goes with is, is set in Yemen, right? And so how did you decide, what's the, the link between the story and the, and the, and the recipe? Well, it, it was really, again, getting that balance between diversity and, and, uh, um, specificity and so um, to get that balance it, it, I felt that it would be good to mix stories from different locations with recipes from different locations and not to be overly specific um, so that 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 was really the um, the idea there and um, I, I did want to try and in terms of the stories, <coughs> cover the region as a as a whole. Um, it, it, it's a region I personally have travelled in quite a bit, and um, all those all the countries I mentioned are all countries I've I've visited and um, and either worked in or or, or spent time in. And so um, I, I was really trying to to get that balance between what the place was like or a story sp related to a place um, and a recipe that was related to somewhere else. And to, in, a, in, in a way to, to, to hint at that uh, um, cross-fertilization that w 
we spoke of earlier in terms of cultures being open uh, to influences. Mm. And then you also have those sort of wonderful little, like, uh, sort of a short history of the chickpea and, and you know, all these, these different elements of, of, of where, what, uh, facts about the food, I guess. Yes, and th that came a little late in the process um, of uh, preparing um, the cookbook, and uh, um, I'm sure it caused Nahid a headache. But um, uh, but she stalwartly uh, and courageously uh, solved the problem. Um, but yes, uh, I felt those were those were important because that, in a sense, is where the um uh, the text overspills the book and becomes relevant uh, or relates should i say to uh cooking and recipes in western society i mean we the spices and the herbs that that i write about uh, in those short um in those very br brief uh um boxes relate to the what what we use today in in, in our cooking uh, cooking here and um, uh, so again it's it, it's not so the, the diversity that I was talking about isn't just isn't contained in the book and contained within a specific region it, it overspills and and it, the cultural diversity is one that we are living. Um, so it's, it, 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 it reaches out beyond, beyond the book to uh, the, the kind of food that we, that we eat on an, an everyday basis um, in terms of the herbs and the spices and uh, um, the ingredients. Nahid, Nahid so, so I really love, love the, 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 the title page and you have all these different kitchen implements. You have a tagine on there, you have a kanaka, you have other items on there. And then also on the, uh, that and the recipe pages, these, these things are put out there, but they're not necessarily labeled. It doesn't say that this is a tagine. You get, give all this sort of additional information, visual information without necessarily spelling out every aspect of it. I wondered if you had thoughts about that, if it is like for inspiration or, um, for further thought or um, why you, so you include so many different sort of Easter egg elements? Uh, first of all, uh, I knew that the time of the older stories is ancient, you know, uh, and uh, most of the foods, uh, as uh, thanks to my uh, Arab friends, uh, I know that most of the foods, uh, you know, uh, it's, um, had roots in their culture and their, you know. Uh, so uh, about this book, I didn't believe that I should uh, draw something uh, contem contemporary. I believe that all my drawings should be related to the uh, ancient stuff and uh, um, even a contemporary kitchen is not, you know, kids uh, are seeing them everywhere but uh, it's interest maybe it's more interesting if they know about uh, their um, if they know about primitive kids kitchen primitive stuff primitive um. thank you so could we just have one tiny tiny question kareem if you were going to make a second book uh, are there any other recipes that you didn't include that you'd like to uh, well, the answer is yes. There are many, many more recipes that one could include in a, in a cookbook. I mean, one could do a, 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 a desserts cookbook, um, which I think would be very appropriate for, for children. Um, and just some of the desserts that um, are in this cookbook. I mean, this cookbook, we try to go from um, starters to main meal to, to desserts. We try to cover the full range of a meal. Um, but one could easily uh, do a... Do a in fact, several Arab cookbooks that are based mm. on uh, uh, different stages of a meal. Um, you know, it's um, it's it's maybe a, a a project for for some later date. 
Right. Well, thank you both. Uh, unfortunately, we, we're, we're finished with our time, but thank you both for, for, for being part of this conversation. Um, and now we have um, Veruska Cantelli and Anita Manor. Thank you so much. Hi, Anita. Hey, how are you? Uh, I see that you've been joined by your cat. He's my, <laughs> he's my collaborator. This is our radical I intimacy. See. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm very, very excited to, um, to have you here. Thank you, Marsha, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to go right uh, into it, um, say just a few things. Um, Bhakti and I have um, collaborated in the past in, uh, on several projects, um, food politics and, and migration, and we have encountered your work in so many different occasions and so many times. So I'm absolutely, uh, I feel privileged to have this conversation with you today. For everyone else, Anita Manur is an associate professor of English at Miami University, author of Culinary Fictions, Food in South uh, Asian Diasporic Culture, and the co-editor of uh, Eating Asia America, a food studies reader. And in her work, she, she tackles um, uh, how fictions on authenticity, uh, belonging, nationalism uh, can be created through food making and food consumption. She actually traces those fictions with particular attention to um, highlighting the ways uh, identities are, can be framed, simplified, often compressed through recipes, food labels, food making, flavors, and food odors. And in her forthcoming book, which is going to be the center of uh, part of the center of our discussion today, which is uh, titled Intimate Eating, Racialized Spaces and Radical uh, Futures, which is forthcoming with Duke University Press in March, we are going to really tackle the idea of uh, intimate eating and what that is. And so I uh, actually would like to go right into my very first question, um, which is, you have done uh, lots of work on, on food politics, in food, what we call food studies in, in, in a scholarly sense, um, with identity, diaspora uh, in South Asian America. And I want to ask you if you could tell us a little bit more of uh, why food? How has food come, um, become the way for you to talk about race, gender, and migration? Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. And um, I mean, you know, I mean, I've been thinking about food for for 20 odd years now. I, I like to say that my research project is, is old enough now to, to drink. Um, but <laughs> uh, I first got interested in, in food, um, start, partly by thinking about the fact that when we think about national cuisines, which is often the way we think about them in the US, Indian, Thai, et cetera, right? That those exist primarily in, in diaspora, right? You can't eat Indian food in that category in India. It becomes very regional. And so similar, and again, as I mentioned, that's similar for other national cuisines. And so I kind of began interested, uh, became interested in tracking that logic from within post-colonial studies of how and why we think about food in national terms, right? And then from there, it became about other kinds of formations that signal the national, like the family or the home, mm. right? Which are these sort of national things. So how and why, you know, is it so important for instance, for people um, and often for mothers to tell their children, right? About the need to know about their food, right? And, um, you know, a long time ago, I'd read an article by my academic advisor at the time, um, our other Krishnan, and it, it was in a collection called, um, uh, hi, Abby, um, in um, Orientations. And in it, he kind of begins with this anecdote about going to a Thai restaurant and having sort of a less than stellar experience because the food didn't feel authentic. And then from there, he discusses what does authenticity mean? And that rang true for me as sort of this Indian diasporic woman, right? Like, what I always kind of felt was a bad translation of something authentic from the homeland, right? And so I wanted to go further and think about why do we think about food in national terms? Um, why do terms like authenticity become mm -hmm. important? And so in some ways, I think food, why food, you know, it became, um, food allowed me to sort of, it, it, it sort of works as a lens to talk about belonging and not belonging, um, nationalism um, and so on. And I became much more attuned over time to how it allowed me to ask broader questions about culture at large, like so uh, about migration, about 
gender. Uh, and so <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this, but often I like to say I'm not interested in food per se, although I guess that's probably <laughs> kind of a lie because I Instagram <laughs> all my meals, but that I'm interested, but actually, I mean, but more seriously, like I don't do research on what do people eat, but I'm interested in asking what do the way we discuss food and talk about food reveal about power, kinship, and so on. And so, you know, lit literature is sort of where I go for my literature and culture to think through these issues. And so why food? I think it's 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 a very important place to begin to ask questions about power, gender, intimacy, so on. Right. Yeah, and 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 in your last your your upcoming book, you're really focusing on how we consume food and where we consume food, and that is also uh, absolutely interesting. Yeah. In fact, um, you share often your your personal experiences um, uh, in in both books, uh, especially I I you know the, in the introduction of your forthcoming book, and uh, and how that food connects to your scholarly work, and and you see and and we see in this new um, book that you're writing the arise of this very beautiful notion of intimacy as a, as a way of understanding uh, food making and food consumption and you know eating food that moves beyond normativity and mainstream neoliberal narratives of intimacy to be together uh, harmoniously to bond can you unpack for us a little more um, what this intimacy is in your in your book yeah I you know, I mean, uh, I don't want to be like, read the book when it comes out. But, <laughs> but um, I mean, for me, I mean, intimacy is really kind of coming out. It, it's not about sort of, it's not about sex. It's not about practices of intimacy in that traditional way, but it is also about that. And for me, intimacy is really informed by the work of, you know, like um, well-established scholars in Asian American studies, like Lisa Lowe and Nayan Shah, but also sort of emerging scholars uh, like Nicolyn Woodcock. and. And especially also for me, the work of the late Lauren Berlant. And I just want to maybe talk a little bit about Berlant's definition, because that's what's, I think, the most important, their, their definition. And I'm especially drawn to this kind of intimacies that Berlant describes as bypassing the couple. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, and so they argue in, in their work, right, that we can kind of think of what, you know, what, what we can sort of call minor intimacies that develop alternative aesthetics and ways of being. And so for me, I think, you know, intimacy, as I'm kind of understanding it, isn't about like imagining sort of lives being sort of teleologically oriented towards securing forms of normativity, right? Or couplehood that are sort of, you know, buoyed by the desires of the nation. For like, you know, I mean, I think in some ways that desire for a normative kind of intimacy very easily eliminates from analysis, those for whom access to, you know, what Berlant talks about is the good life and sort of, you know, basically intimacy with its sort of continued, mm -hmm. continual attachment to heteronormative happiness. I mean, that's not just unattainable for many people. It's also sometimes just undesirable, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think here most specifically in, 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 um, in that term that Berlant provides. And, and I think they note that this sort of overbearing kind of hegemonic version of a kind of intimacy that's oriented towards this telos of heteronormative happiness is a kind of narrative or story, right? And one, and there's a great line that I wanna quote from them. They say, those who don't or can't find their way in that story, right? The mm. mainstream story, mm. the queers, the singles, the something else's can so easily become unimaginable even often to themselves. And so to imagine how it is that queer singles and the something else's find ways to create imaginable narratives um, and the way that they find intimacy through food is kind of really what is, is sort of what I'm, I'm interested in, right? So um, even if we are looking at a couple, what if it's about not being oriented towards future future happiness and happily ever afters, but different kinds of futures. And maybe that's where I'm sort of trying to think about what is radical about that. So, yeah, but, uh, uh, actually I was very, um, uh, one of the parts that interested me uh, very much was the idea of what you call the solo eating. Yeah, and you have illustrated that also with your, um, uh, 
you know, your your practice of going to restaurants and eating on your own and that pra the practice of intimacy can be created as a solo eating practice is using your own work. And you, uh, in fact, you say often in in one quotation particularly, you say uh, you define the single person and, as queer agent and not a failed subject, which is a really important and, and very powerful statement. Um, so... Can you though say to us a little bit how does this solo eating, for instance, uh, intersect uh, or um, can be explained in the context of gender and race? Because it is a I guess yeah. a different experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I mean, eating is cooking, eating. They're always gendered, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think when you eat alone, that experience is even more acute acute right when you feel in some ways that you are hyper visible because of race or gender or sexuality right there's always that sense of other people are looking at me um and i think for a woman often to eat alone right or at least this is the perception that people have whether it's accurate or not this is why it's good to be a literary critic i don't have to actually <laughs> talk to people about what's true um you know like to eat alone is to sort of invite fear or pity or even reproach and and I think, you know, my own experiences with eating alone led me to find intimacy, both good and bad, right, in sort of unexpected places. Like, and I mean, as I've mentioned, you know, I think we've talked about meals are often imagined as about eating together with family and loved ones. And, you know, we eat with other people to uh, establish connections with, with people that we love and care about uh, and to establish intimacy and and often to avoid being alone right um sitting together around a table like is a way for people to be convivial right and but i think under sort of the you know as i mentioned before right like sort of trying to always access or secure this good life um there there's sort of an implicit way that the way sort of normative ways of being or moving through the world um is is as a couple and so i think um part of you know this sort of under such, you know, these sort of these, these sort of circumstances, right? The success embedded in sort of being a good subject is measured by one's ability to be a part of a certain kind of unit. Um, and that social value really comes from attachments to units like the couple or the family. And um, I think under, you know, sort of neoliberal multiculturalism, we're kind of reminded of the aspirational quality of that lifestyle. And, you know, even if one when all of us eat alone or without a partner or without a family that somehow one should you know desire that again that arrangement so i guess i'm what i'm that's sort of very long way to get at saying that you know what well what if we flip the script and consider the ways in which intimacy and happiness aren't always about uh being among others um mm -hmm. what if the act of solo eating can be a kind of intimacy. And that's kind of what I try to get at in the book by looking at photographs, for instance, of people eating alone who are neither unhappy nor happy, right? It's just a way of being. Um, and so I think it allows us to access alternative visions of gender and sexuality, right? One in which uh, there are possibilities for intimacy and queer subjectivities to emerge when women choose to eat alone in public or semi-public spaces. And so, and I think, so it's to that end, and here I'm taking a little bit of, of a page from Michael Cobb's work about trying to like rethink what does the single mean and why is the single a reviled figure? And so that's why I want to think of the single kind of as a queer figure, right? A non-normative subject who refuses this normative orientation towards consumption and, um, you know, and think about solo dining as as a form of communion with the self. Um, that makes yeah, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yes. And so uh, to follow up on the on the solo eating, I guess it, it, there's um, in in this book uh, particularly you focus on where and how food is consumed mm -hmm. and perhaps also made to highlight how uh, precisely intimacy can function as a disruption of uh, stereotypical and damaging narratives of diasporic mm -hmm. identities and specifically you speak about public spaces <laughs> and often you make references to even you know office uh, office rooms and spaces where people co-workers eat together do you think that cookbooks can be a site that can create the intimacy that you refer to? And can a cookbook be viewed as a public, quote unquote, public site uh, for radical intimacies? 
Yes. I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Moving on. No. Um, you know, absolutely. Right. I think radical work happens in different ways. Uh, not in the Jamie Oliver sense, right? But I would also make the you know argument like that. You know, Anita Lowe's Soul Eating, like which I conveniently have here, and everyone's like, "Oh, look, it's a book written by you know." Why are Anita so interested in solo eating? I'm like, it's just how we are. Um, but I'm, um, but I mean, you know, eating can be a kind of there can be a kind of radical intimacy just to eating right because it's about bringing you know or cooking at home because it's about bringing pleasure and a sense of plenitude right to to the solo dining experience at home and i mean i think in terms of cookbooks i mean you know anita lowe's book is 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 sort of amazing because it does do that it doesn't tell you the like half the recipe it's like a whole it's whole in its single you know orientation to the single um, but I mean, in terms of like, you know, cookbooks as sites for radical intimacy, I mean, I, I'm just going to maybe mention a couple of books that I like. Um, you know, I think I also love like Nick Sharma's book, you know, not the new, I mean, I love the new one too, but like, I love season, the first one, I can't get the angle. Um, because he makes it clear that cooking is about being part of a queer couple, about being a brown person and, um, and, and not about reproducing heteronormativity, but then, you know, there's also books like, you know, Decolonizing Your Diet. I'm just going to keep showing the mm. book that I have. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, um, or the Gaza cookbook, right? <laughs> or one other one that I have, uh, Bibi's Kitchen. And um, to me, these books, okay, now I'm done with the show and tell portion of this. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I think to me, these create intimacies because of the kind of readership and public that they create. Um among home cooks, right? And who want to cook a different way and with different goals and not from some like fancy chef, right? And so I think sometimes cookbooks incite, these kinds of cookbooks especially, incite conversations and instigate new ideas about what food justice looks like or what eating together or eating alone looks like. And to me, that's an act of radical intimacy, right? With what's happening in the book, but then also that relationship for us as, as readers. And, you know, I mean, to me, these are radical intimacies because, you know, the cookbook is an author isn't like, you know, a Rick Bayless who goes in and, you know, raids Mexican abuela's recipes and then says, like, I have discovered Mexican food. Right. But these authors honor like the women from whom they get the rest. They name them. They put pictures of them. They they tell their stories. And that and to me, this shouldn't be radical. Right. It. But the simple act of honoring and acknowledging whose labor goes into making recipes possible is radical, right? And so when collaboration and honoring histories and stories is part of that picture, then I think we kind of take some pretty um, significant strides, right? In, in terms of bringing forward these radical intimacies. And so I think if we look at these kinds of cookbooks, right, that may not themselves, some of them do, but that may not themselves describe themselves as radical, they are doing radical work because of just that way that we've sort of privileged, well, the way that they deprivilege um, sort of stardom around the cookbook author and tell the stories of the people where these recipes come from. So, um... In this partaking, right, in this in, in this intimacy, um, often, as you said before, you we underline that the idea that we eat together to create um, perhaps these you know normative ways of understanding belonging and understanding uh, coming together, um, uh, normative ways of seeing of acquiring you know be, being together, um, aligned towards happiness. You 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 counter that narrative with the idea of eating with strangers. And um, so can you explain a bit more how notions of belonging are problematizing these radical intimacy of eating and cooking with strangers, not with people that you are, you know, you know family members or, or very, you know, very close uh, friends, for instance, or intimate people? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I get it. You know, I mean, part of my, my work as a cultural critic is kind of taking, looking at how other people have, have brought that conversation forward. And so I'm really interested in, in two particular spaces that do that. And they're both art installations that became restaurants, provisional restaurants. So, I mean, people may be familiar with, say, Conflict Kitchen in Pittsburgh. And um, the other is Enemy Kitchen by uh, Michael Rakowitz. That was a temporary art installation. And, and I mean, I think one of the things that both of these um, spaces do, and maybe a little bit more um, 
enemy kitchen um, particularly does is is to kind of ask people um, uh, and actually, I mean, Conflict Kitchen does this too, asks people to sit down with people that they don't know, right? And to talk about political issues. Um, so Conflict Kitchen was, you know, would serve up food from countries that the US was in conflict with, but that, so they had a, like a little tiny um, location mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh, but they also had these like um, Zoom, or well, I guess it wasn't Zoom at the time, Skype events where they would mm -hmm. connect people who didn't know each other. And so one of the things I did was I participated in a cooking lesson of how to make North Korean food. And it was on Skype, which in 2013 was so radical. Now, of course, we're just like, oh, Zoom, here we go again, you know. But <laughs> and, and so, you know, I mean, we all cooked together and then we didn't know each other. Um, but we really had to kind of listen to each other. Right. And like hear like people who were in Korea, people who were former, you know, who were North Korean defectors. And um, and so that sort of common but very trite saying that, you know, keep politics off the table, mm. like what Conflict Kitchen actually did was say, no, we actually are going to start with politics at the table. And then from there kind of understand the kind of connections that are possible so that strangers who wouldn't have, I mean, you know, there were people that I would never have met and, but, you know, food, by centering politics and then talking about food, we were really able to kind of, I think, not necessarily, I mean, I, wanna, I don't want to be Pollyanna and be like, everything changed as a result of it. But I think it's sort of, you know, we sort of sat there with discomfort and language barriers and, and you know, technological problems. And, and from there, a kind of provisional intimacy sort of emerged. And I think those, and I think that's what I value is like, not things that necessarily last all the time, right? Because I mean, that's the whole thing about the kind of intimacies I'm interested in, not that sort of long-term goal of heteronormativity that's about a happily ever after, but those provisional moments, those fleeting moments, right? Like those can be very transformative, right? And so um, that's kind of, maybe that's a little bit of what I think stranger intimacy can do. Even if we don't remember yeah. the names of the people, we remember the affective sort of quality of that. Yeah, and, and that idea of uh, sitting there or uh, cooking together with that sense of perhaps uh, unfamiliarity which mm -hmm. is not what we expect, what we think um, food always has to bring, right? That idea of coming together in harmony. And be, I mean, some mm -hmm. of the mem most hor horrendous memories at the table in my family um, have been around holidays, exactly. So I uh, yes, completely you know, enjoy a season. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Red it's meals with people that yeah. we love. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, your, your, um, works um it brings several examples in in which intimacies as you as we explained so far are particularly disruptive of um of normative narratives in public spaces and they maybe functions a little bit uh, as space invaders to use nirmal purwar's work um and um you mention one of uh, one particular example of what maybe is solo eating, um, and you bring up the book "Eat, Pray, Love" by Elizabeth Gilbert. Gilbert, and here the single person is in, in search for food adventure mm -hmm. that submits to the intimacy to the white privileged neoliberal feminist narrative of seeking refuge. I'm quoting your words in otherness, and so. I believe, um, and think that we all probably share this, that cookbooks have and could have the potential to recreate this notion of consuming the other. Mm -hmm. um, Bhakti gave a couple of examples at the beginning in the introduction. So how do you think that we need to approach an understanding and creation of radical book, uh, book uh, cookbooks that um, um, re uh, cre in relation to or recre can recreate these, have a possibility to create these radical intimacies? Yeah. I mean, you know, I could go on for, for hours. I mean, what <laughs> <nonsense laughs> Me so much um, to, to talk about. Um, I, I, you know, I think, I think one, you know, you mentioned Eat, Pray, Love, but I'm kind of thinking about one example that comes to mind in this sort of genre of, you know, white ladies who try to make Indian food more approachable and take refuge in otherness while not acknowledging the labor of women of color is, is Alison Roman, right? Um, and she has, you know, like last year, there was that recipe for something called a stew, which I looked at, I was like, this is a really like just a bad version of a, a, a chickpea curry, chana masala, right? Mm -hmm. But like with too much coconut milk in it. Um, 
Um, but then like two weeks ago, she had this thing called gentle lentils. And I was like, oh, she's making doll, right? And I'm like, <laughs> when does she stop, right? Like, stop it. But like, I think even the most, sm the smallest step towards sort of a more radical orientation would not necessarily say, you know, please don't make our food, right? Please don't eat our food. That's not the end point, right? But just to say, please acknowledge what you do, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think like, this is, kind of a bad analog, so please don't like, you know, but you know, I think that we think about like land acknowledgement, right? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you know, it, I mean, I think there's problems in the way that they've become very sort of like co-opted, right? Like by the mainstream at this point. And it doesn't really think about sort of settler colonialism and violence, but just like, oh, we live on these lands that were given to us. No, no, they weren't. But I think, you know, but one way to think about it is in the cookbook, why not like, why focus on the self so much, but why mm -hmm. not think about where these ingredients come from, you know? Um, you know, I mean, just one example would be like, you know, if you're, if you've got a recipe for all of focaccia, like here's an opportunity to kind of talk about like what's happening with, you know, the plight of olive trees in Palestine, right? <laughs> like that they're being destroyed in order to produce certain kinds of narrative about land and belonging. Um, so, you know, I think decentering the subject and, you know, you know, focusing on the food and the history of it is one way to kind of, I think, not consume the other. Um, so, mm -hmm. if that, if yeah, that I mean, sure. Yeah. Through this, so, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, to, yeah, I want to quote, um, I want to uh, give, we'd like to conclude this uh, uh, conversation with you and, and, and just share with, with you and, and, and the rest of the, of the people listening here, one quotation from your introduction of, the, of your new book that says, there is no recipe that allows one to produce the kind of meal that will always satisfy the capricious and yet predictably toxic desires of an heteronormative cis male patriarchy. So against this, or in relation to this, can you share with us that recipe? <laughs> that oh recipe, my God. recipe Wait, that would be able to do that. <laughs> oh God! Uh, I don't. I don't know. I'm still looking for it. Um, I think it's again. It's not one recipe, right? And I think we know that, right? But it's a sort of set of orientations and desires and um, possibilities and. Um, if I think if I had, if I had the recipe that would, I can't, that's actually a good sentence. I can't believe I wrote that. Um, but, um, yeah. You know, I mean, I think, you know, and I think that's the good thing about food and food waste, right? That they change. And, and um, so uh, I feel like I'm ending on a very like ambiguous note, but, you know, I think it's, it's about processes about who do we think about how do we form those intimacies with people and that food isn't always about say satisfying patriarchy but about those experiences mm -hmm. that people might have in cooking and eating together with strangers alone or with friends or cats okay but i won't eat my cat's food but you know <laughs> <laughs> prepared <laughs> together yes so what um what is uh what would be the next um you i know you are almost finished with this book and it's coming up but i always am interested in seeing where would be the next idea for you the next uh position for you in terms of looking at food and food making you know i've been trying to break up with food for a really long time <laughs> i said i would write my first book on food about you know guy wrote culinary fictions uh and but i was like well, I guess I still have some stuff to say, but actually what I'm doing is I, I think I'm sort of at a stage in my career where I want to like hear from other people. And so I know that um, uh, Bhakti, I think had mentioned eating Asian America, or you had also mentioned it as a collection that I worked on. So what's next for yeah. me is, is we're, uh, I think I can say this, uh, a sequel, um, eating more Asian America and showcasing like the work that has happened in the last you know, 10, 15 years since, I mean, that book was like published 10 years ago. So what is, yes. now I'm more interested in what does the next generation of, of scholars have to say about food? Um, and so that's for me. I wanna go, I'm, I'm behind the scenes and I wanna like help their work come forward and for them to speak about food and, um, you know, can't retire yet, but I can at least help, <laughs> help you know, like try to sure. show other people's voice and uplift their their scholarship, so some of whom may be listening today and, and they know who they are. 
So. Excellent, excellent. So, thank you so much, Anita. It was really a pleasure thank to you. meet you thank and you. to have this conversation. I am going to definitely keep um, looking at your work and uh, can't wait to finish to, to read the entire book um, that we discussed today. Thank you very much. And we have next um, Bhakti Shrinkar Pure and Ismail Einashe today. So thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Varushka. That was amazing. <laughs> I'm going to join Ishmael now. See ya. Whoops. Hey. Hi. Hi. How are you? How are you? Welcome. Good. How's it going? Good. Thank you for having me. Good evening uh, from a cold London. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think cold everywhere. I'm in rural, cold Connecticut. Um, and here we are talking about many warm, uh, wonderful foods. Thanks for joining me, Ishmael. And I'm going to very quickly uh, tell people who you are, uh, which is that you are an award-winning, prolific journalist who has been uh, writing for places like the BBC and The Guardian, The Nation, uh, and so on for a very long time. Uh, I, of course, have the privilege uh, to know you on a personal level. You did some uh, work also with me for Warscapes uh, magazine uh, mm -hmm. before. So uh, and then, you know, we became friends. And the, the privilege I've had um, because of this friendship is to taste all the amazing food you make and to learn about your many talents uh, <laughs> as a chef. And I know you... Um, I know also that you have a, a pretty intense family history uh, where you've had family that was, um, you know, displaced from Somaliland, uh, were in refugee camps in Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, when you, you came, you know, you came to the UK at such a super young um, age. So I know that you have a very specific connection with food and growing up around aunts and stuff like that. Uh, but I'm going to start uh, mm -hmm. with a more general question, because I know you've been living in Palermo, mm -hmm. uh, in Sicily, uh, and you've been covering migration for many years now. Uh, and this is such a crucial work because this so-called crisis is only becoming worse and worse. Uh, and I think we get to tend to get swept up in the horror and the details of these ocean crossings and then tend to neglect to some degree the aftermaths, which is like cultural assimilation, whether it's jobs or rents or food. Um, and I know that you've spoken to a lot of uh, super courageous people, like very young people, too, who have taken these journeys. And since we're talking food and cookery as it relates to displacement, um, can you talk a bit about the basic challenges uh, for migrants upon arrival when it comes to uh, food? Yeah, thank you so much, Bhakti. It's a privilege to be with you all. Um, so I've been reporting for the last sort of five years on and off um, from Palermo. Uh, like many journalists, I came during the so-called so so migrant crisis, uh, which we always put in inverted commas, uh, because it's largely a manufactured crisis, uh, serves a political agenda for certain individuals and groups and nations and so on. Um, but in terms of my reporting on the ground in Palermo, it's an incredibly interesting city. I know you've been... Um, it's got these amazing layers of history. Everybody's been there, the Normans, the Greeks, the Arab, the French, and so on. Um, so the thousands of Africans that have been arriving uh, largely from uh, uh, Libya um, after making arduous journeys uh, across the continent uh, into Italy um, have, um, you know, it's been settling in Palermo for the last few decades. And there's been this amazing cultural sort of mixing happening in this uh, city of Palermo, which has this sort of, you know, ancient history, sort of migration, movement, connection, and contemporary ones. And I think, of course, the immediate problems that people face are one of, you know, um, having survived a traumatic, difficult, arduous journey, arriving in a place in which often they have no documentation, they have real economic hardship. Many of the women that I interview, for example, some come from Nigeria, from Edo State, many are trafficked into sexual slavery and so on. So there's real urgent issues that are really systematic and terrible that people face but mm. eventually people do settle and there has been a community um 
presence largely West African, so Nigerian, Senegalese, Gambians, um, that are, I would say, perhaps the more predominant um, people from African backgrounds in Palermo. Um, and they're really alongside also migrants from other parts of the world, particularly from Bangladesh and China, um, and also from Sri Lanka, they are sort of reshaping this sort of cultural space in Palermo. And you see that in the ingredients when you go around mm. the city of Palermo, particularly in Balero, which is an incredible kind of intense place. Um, it's an old market, which has really been rejuvenated by migrants. And you're kind of seeing things you don't see in the Italian sort of kitchen in a sense, you know, you're seeing ingredients that people are unfamiliar with. Of course, having said that, I'd quickly add that Sicily, of course, is also this, as I mentioned, this amazing place of, you know, cultural mixing, sort of the edge of Europe. So a lot of the ingredients that we think of Sicilian, you know, sort of cuisine, if you think of things like, you know, um, pistachio and um, almonds and, you know, aubergine mm. and cheese, you know, all those things were really brought by the Arabs to Sicily in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just... I also remember eating really good samosas in Palermo. <laughs> yes, they have really good samosas in Palermo. Yeah. All the Bangladeshi restaurants and stalls sell samosas, but also some of the West African stalls also sell um, samosas as well. Mm -hmm. And would you say that this is a... Uh, so, in a way, there is a kind of uh, familiarity or there are, there, you know, uh, the migrants that arrive may not find themselves like completely lost and cold and unhappy in a way. I know you recently wrote about um, the food banks that uh, mm. these uh, Nigerian women, I believe, uh, yeah. were running. Uh, what was that? What was that article? What were you writing about? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we shouldn't shy away from the real hardships that people face in Palermo and generally in Sicily and Italy who come, you know, after having such difficult journeys. Um, this article that I wrote that you mentioned is um, a piece that I published uh, last month for BBC News. And it's this sort of remarkable story of this group of uh, Nigerian women, largely from Edo State, headed um, uh, by this amazing kind of inspiring um, activist um, called Osas Ekbon. She runs the Women of Benin City and they help uh, rescue um, women and girls from life of forced sex work and trafficking. Wow. And she runs this shelter also for women, um, where women you know who have to escape for their lives literally can go and hide in. And she uh, set that up last year, did another story about that. Uh, with wow. her last year also for the BBC. But for this year, she set up this food bank to basically help families that are really struggling because of the COVID-19 pandemic, they can't feed themselves. So this community centre in the heart of Palermo gave her this space and she basically um, gets some support from some charities in Palermo, but essentially she gets ingredients, um, whatever she can get, rice, pasta, sugar, um, and to give to these families and up to 40 families come once a month for these essential food items. Mm -hmm. um, they also hand out um, things like Parmesan cheese, wow. prosciutto, and so on, which are, I understand, less um, popular. And actually, when I was there doing the story with her back in, um, in September, I was there sort of observing what's going on and interviewing the people there and stuff. And uh, at one point, this woman walked in and um, um, she got her sort of food parcel and then she was also given some risotto rice. And she just sort of looked at the, you know, one of the volunteers who, who was an Italian volunteer and sort of said, what, what do I do with this? I don't know how you could risotto rice. <laughs> and then the Italian volunteer was really animated and was telling her what she could do with, um, with the risotto rice. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, that's wild. Um, so, you know, let's, uh, let's get to you. Uh, now, because uh, you know the one wh one of the things I wanted to talk about, of course, is uh, my, you know out of selfish interest uh, mm -hmm. is 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 Somali food, um, yeah. and you know which has Italian influences, uh, uh, English, French, so many different um, uh, so many different things, and it's a very unique uh, cuisine too. At the end of the day. Um, I know that you were very young when your family uh, moved to the to to the UK, and I just wondered what role did sort of Somali cuisine uh, play in your life as someone who was brought to a new place, being so little, uh, you know, just yeah. Well, you know, I came to the UK when I was about ten, so I was sort of halfway between being really little and sort of not quite grown. So I think for me, you know, food is a really important part of 
you know, our identity of who we are. Also, you know, I'm just a person who's often very hungry. So, you know, I like to eat. Um, and when I was growing up, um, you know, in um, uh, in Somaliland, in Somalia, in the Somali region of Ethiopia as well, and then coming to the UK as a refugee with my family, you know, um, I always remember food and the smells and um, the scent of, of, of cooking and people preparing mm. food and the communal act and the intimacy that comes from that, being really happy. And I think it's really interesting when we talk about displacement and the idea of you know being a refugee and what someone takes with them when they leave where they come from because they have no choice but to leave because of conflict or violence in the case of my family and many other families from the Somali context. Um, and then you go somewhere very different. Um, and I remember arriving in the 90s in the UK and back then it was quite difficult to actually um, get certain ingredients that you could um you know you would need like tamarind and um cinnamon bark and that sort of stuff um that you would you know and bebre and that sort of stuff that you wouldn't find so mm. easily um in in the uk but i think for me food has played a really powerful role in connecting me into that kind of past of of, of just watching my aunts and the women because the women are the bedrock um of uh, you know somali cookery tradition um, mm -hmm. and watching them you know chop onions up prepare flour kneading dough to make flatbreads you know the scent of um shah which is spiced tea wow. with milk you know these very intimate kind of personal moments that mm -hmm. when you're very young you just take as an everyday interaction as an everyday encounter because this is what people do they get up in the morning make breakfast they have lunch they have dinner but the older i've gotten particularly because of the pandemic i guess because i spend a lot of time you know not <laughs> traveling and doing things i've sort of gone back to that past of mm -hmm. of those memories and i think again when i this idea of displacement is that we don't necessarily put food in the mix usually we think of mm -hmm. other things often you know uh, mm -hmm. you know we think of other things, not so much of food. And for me, food remains and has been the most powerful connection I've had to my heritage. And right. also, you know, when you have a context, like in my family, you know, the war destroyed everything we had. So there's no photographs, mm -hmm. you know, we have no real documentation, no birth certificates, no passports. So how do you go back and remember who you were and where you came from. And I think you, as I get older, realize uh, you remember by cooking and, and by wow. the ingredients and the dishes of where you come from. Th those are the most visceral, powerful connections I remember growing right. up. That's beautiful. You know, it's a kind of, uh, it's almost, uh, is like a, a memory embedded in your skin and the smells and it's a, it's a, it's a kind, it's a sort of history that lives on you, you know. Yeah, so absolutely. And people can read this piece that I wrote for, on, on the BBC. It's called the uh, it's Letter from Africa, The Wonders of Somali Cuisine and a Taste of Home. Uh, or you can follow me at uh, Ismail Nashe uh, mm -hmm. on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the other, uh, you know, I wanted to get more into, and I have some photos mm. uh, of of your cooking and so on. But before mm -hmm. we before we get into that, I just yes. I I wondered uh, in the U.S., for example, um, you know, at least on the East Coast, uh, maybe it's different in in Minneapolis where there's a large Somali population. Um, you know, there's hardly any restaurants, mm. and you know, there's there's not very much. Um, the capacity for us to enjoy or experience uh, Somali food. And there's actually not a ton of cookbooks either. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think the Ethiopian, why, you know, everywhere there's Ethiopian, <laughs> there's Ethiopian <laughs> food everywhere. Yes. What, what do you make of this difference and what's mm. the scene in London mm. or? I think that's a really good question, Bhakti. And, you know, I partly grew up in Ethiopia and I love Ethiopian food and there's a lot of similarities, but Ethiopian and Eritrean food, are more similar than they are broadly similar to Somali food, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Somali food is really sort of home cooking. Um, it, it's it's it, it, it's the mothers, it's the aunts, it's the sisters, um, and restaurants traditionally, you know, I'm generalizing, tend to be populated by men in public spaces in Somali region, whether you're in Somalia, in Somaliland, or the Somali region, or Ethiopia, for example, or even northern Kenya. Um, so I think that might explain one reason why Somali food is not as popular as Eritrean Ethiopian food. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I was really amazed when I um, wrote that piece for the BBC about Somali cuisine and about my experience and journey with it. I had so many people get in touch with me and they were asking that question, you know, where do I go to eat Somali food? You know, whether, whether, whether they're in Toronto, or in LA or Nairobi or London or Helsinki. And they also said, you know, what do I read? And I said, well, there are, you know, increasingly, you know, uh, cookbooks that are emerging, which is fantastic, like, you know, how Hassan in Bibi's Kitchen has a section, you know, you mentioned, for example, uh, mm -hmm. Sofista, you know, which means come sit down. It's uh, from 2018. It's really fantastic. Ah, mm -hmm. got it there. It's a fantastic yep. book. Um, there are also blogs that people can go on, Hawaj, um, as well, Somali Kitchen. There are lots of YouTube right. tutorials, lots of Somali aunts getting busy on, on YouTube, you know. <laughs> So if you have a bit of time spare, you know, uh, check it out. But yes, I think this, you know, delectable, hearty cuisine is Somali cuisine, which is so complex and has so many layers to it. It's a shame it's not more well known. I I, I think it's a real shame. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but um, hopefully that might change. And I think there's also, oh, the photos. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Um, oh, um, um, yeah. But there's a new generation as well, you know, Bhakti. There's a lot of people on YouTube. There's a lot of mm -hmm. people on Instagram. And I, you know, and I think that's where things might go next. So let's hope that there are more cookbooks out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I'm going to, I have, I have more slides of you. And yeah. I just, I, you know, I, I love this. It was great. Somali American yeah. cookbook. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I think you need to kind of maybe um, work on something uh, because oh, okay. you, I think you're so <laughs> accomplished in this. I'm going to show some photos. Well, I have to say, I'm a cook. You know, I'm self-taught and I do experiment with lots of different cuisines, particularly Mediterranean cuisine, but mm -hmm. I'm not a chef, so I'm a bit shy. But but thank you for the encouraging words. Maybe, you know. <laughs> I think, you know. I think the, sh <laughs> the chef is one profession and it's to do it's with restaurants restaurants and catering yeah, but i think as a writer that's a whole uh, like writing about food is mm. is its own uh, version and i know you can write but i'm going to i'm going to beam up some photos and mm -hmm. do you want to kind of uh, i i know that uh, you mentioned Hawa Hassan's uh, book Bibi's Kitchen i think Anita Manor mentioned it uh, mm -hmm. in the previous but i think the book is Pan East African, it and is. I think uh, it's from eight countries uh, yes. or something like that. But maybe you can give us a few nuts and bolts of uh, Somali food. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna really I, I'm gonna show these photos, and then you can tell me what yeah. they are. What are you making here? So this is me in my flat, which is where I am at the moment, and this is just a, a classic, you know, biris and hilib dish. So it's just rice and meat, um, mm -hmm. and the rice is the crux of Somali cuisine, I'd say, the most important thing is rice. And in that we share um, a lot of commonalities with the culture of the Indian Ocean. You know, Somalia is this really strategic place um, along the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea, but we're also born in Ethiopia. So mm -hmm. everything is about the rice. So to make that rice, it takes quite a bit of time. Um, mm -hmm. You have to really get the stock going with a lot of meat, uh, with onions, carrots, etc. Um, and the meat usually is lamb or goat. Um, mm -hmm. Here you'll see a couple more photos of me mixing, uh, particularly with Mediterranean kind of palette. So I like to bring some olives and kind of, you know, capers and stuff like that into some of the cookery that I make. Mm -hmm. uh, but here you'll see a little salad, which is very classic. It's onion, tomatoes with lots of um, lime juice and chilies. Bit of a yogurt dip, which you don't necessarily see in Somali cuisine, but I think it cuts through the meat and the fatness of the lamb or the goat mm -hmm. and the rice. So I just make it with some Greek yogurt and then peel chopped, finely chopped um, cucumber with garlic. On the other picture, um, you'll see um, I also made a dish which is roughly Somali inspired. It's got chicken thighs, but I wanted to incorporate a bit of Persian flavor. So I put a bit of saffron in there and walnuts. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, um, I think experimentation is key, but the bedrock to Somali cooker really is hawaj, which is our spice mix where everything starts from wow. there, you know, and, okay. you know, that there's lots of recipes for that um, mm -hmm. um, spice mix, but it's things like cardamom pods, cinnamon, mm -hmm. black pepper, etc. Then you're talking about rice and meat. It's always the classic kind of bedrock or rice and fish. And then you're mm -hmm. talking about all the um, side dishes that go along with that. Right. And the, salads and the fish so cooking. 
Uh, Ismail, what about, uh, isn't there a lot of camel meat uh, dishes? Do you do you tend to cook with camel milk or camel meat? Maybe in London, not so much. I think you had in Nairobi. Well, you know, if you can tell me a place I can go and find a camel in London, maybe I'll cook it this evening. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> no, um, it's harder to get camel meat in the UK, but mm -hmm. it's increasing. You can get camel milk. Right. I like, obviously I love camel, but I think it's a particular taste. Yeah. Um, so you can cook with it. Um, and um, my aunts, particularly in Hargeisa and in the countryside near Hargeisa, are really very, um, you know, uh, amazing and cooking it. But you would cook the, the, the meat in the same way that you might cook goat. Um, you didn't have some of the hump. Mm -hmm. um, so fat. It's very, very tasty. It's a very particular taste, I have to say. It's more gamey. Camel. Right, 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 camel right. Um, camel milk tea is one of the best things on earth. And when you have fresh camel milk, it's one of the best things ever. I remember in 2019, I was on the border between Somaliland and Ethiopia, and I was, um, you know, doing a story. And we came across these, you know, um, men who were, you know, camel herders, and they gave me the freshest camel milk you could ever imagine. And it's really pungent, in, but in a really amazing way, like a really aged, fine cheese, maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yes, we cook with with um, with camel. I also do want to say though we also have more traditional less sort of rice pasta um i'll come back to the pasta dish but yeah uh, oh, right there do you mm -hmm. want to talk about the pasta dish now or uh let's talk about le yeah let's talk about the pasta dish because uh yeah i you know i i'm always so uh, of course i haven't been to somalia i would love to be mm. there and uh mm. but i've been to somaliland mm. and um and you know it was always rice and there was always pasta, and uh, for <laughs> for carb carb uh, <laughs> bingers like me, this is just amazing. Yeah, so, is the heaven. pasta is the pasta an Italian um, mm. influence? Well, it is an Italian influence, um, and the sugo is the sauce, which um, um, is usually we use uh, cubed uh, goat or mm. lamb, even camel. And then we also use tomato and passata, uh, but then we add hawaj, these heady spices, which we make our own and we have our own version. Oh, there you go. That's me. That's a spice mix. Um, and then you have our sort of version of the Italian soffitto. You know, we mm. don't use celery, we use carrot, green peppers and onions and garlic. So, um, and also I add tamarind um, um, uh, okay. paste, which is, I buy the tamarind dry and then um, I put a bit of hot water with some of the dried um, tamarind and uh, mm -hmm. let it soak, the, the, you know, the, the hot water soaks in and then you use some of that um, juice into mm -hmm. the cooking. Um, but yes, it, it's not all carbs, Somali food. It's really important to remember because the traditional Meat. old school food is a lot of grains, full, um, you know, a lot of beans, corn, those type of things. But in a way, you know, these days, if you go to a restaurant in the West or in the Somali region, you're going to get pasta and rice. And you also have seen photos in there of chicken, which I'm obsessed with, which in the piece that I wrote for the BBC, which is mm -hmm. online, you can find a recipe for chicken. And chicken, or also called baspas in the South, mm -hmm. is a hot, uh, you know, green chili side dish. And no Somali meal is ever complete without it. And it includes green chilies, of course, uh, ripe mm -hmm. tomatoes, coriander, um, also. Um, is that is that what you're mixing here? Yes, that's that... what I'm mixing there. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Wonderful. And yeah. then what is this uh, in the jar? So this is hawaj. This is the spice mix. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mix. Yeah, yeah. So okay. that's the spice mix. Um, so it includes, I mentioned the things, things like, you know, black peppercorn and cloves and mm -hmm. uh, cinnamon bark and cardamom, and you sort of, you know, yeah. toast them and extract the oily scent. It's all it's all very spiritual, really. And I think, you know, Somali food has a lot of influences from India, mm -hmm. no doubt, of course, from Yemen. I mean, yeah. I think Yemen is a really important country for us in that region yeah. of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, Marak, like a lot of the rice dishes, a lot of them really originate in, in Yemen mm -hmm. and right. trade coming of course um, then the colonial influences of course we have um you know things like pasta and ravioli but mm -hmm. you know we made our own so i think there's these kind of histories and connections uh, particularly between italy and, and and somalia and i spend a lot of time in italy so i've cooked 
our version of, of, of uh, Somali bolognese, if you like, for right. them. And right. they were all a bit, um, slightly taken back, especially because you serve everything with bananas, as you can see in the photo. Yeah, you tell me about the bananas, because I know also that there is an etiquette with the bananas. I, ha I had that feeling sometimes because yes. I don't, I'm sort of semi, not allergic to banana, but I, I don't digest them. So I, I don't think it's cool to skip them in a Somali meal. <laughs> <way. laughs> I don't think it is. I mean, bananas grow, you know, um, mostly in the South, um, uh, you know, particularly around the areas where the rivers are. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yes, I would say no meal is complete without it. And it's, again, this kind of savory and sweet combo. Mm -hmm. And if you have your, because Somali food actually isn't that hot in terms of spice. It's very fragrant. Mm -hmm. There's very, a lot of layers because of the, for example, the rice dish, you put a lot of effort into making the stock in which you could put the rice, the meat has mm -hmm. less spice. And then you have the shikni, the green chili sauce, which you serve on the side, which gives that heat. And then the banana tempers that heat and fragrance. So it's a really nice combo. And mm -hmm. what I do always is I squeeze a bit of lime juice on the banana. You must. And Somalis also have a um, um, thing where for dessert, you can have, and I love, uh, just watermelon, fresh watermelon. You mm -hmm. just squeeze a lot of lime juice and it gives you that freshness. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to any Somali meal. It's a thing that most people who try Somali food Somali food, excuse me, always remember because it is unusual. Um, yeah. But once you've tasted it, you you will never go back. Right, right. Okay, that's this is a good you've lesson seen, actually. Uh, I've seen, I've, been, I've cooked for you, of course, many times, and I know you're not a big fan of bananas, but just a little <laughs> bit, it's all right, you know. Sure, sure, sure. I will. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, when you wrote mm. uh, when you wrote your article in the BBC mm. uh, on Somali cooking. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of people were annoyed as well. Uh, do you, what what was the sticking point here? What was the what were the Somali food wars about? We always talk about the Jollof wars in <laughs> West Africa. What was happening? Well, thank God, Jamie Oliver hasn't yet found Somali cuisine because if that happens, oh. that would be you know things would be kicking off. Um, yeah, I think you know. Things like food, it's about, you know, who we are, it's about our mums and dads and families. So they're very close to us as people, you mm -hmm. know. So I think people get very um, attached to these things. But people um, were quite taken, it was a few, I have to say, a minority. Um, but um, the way I said shikni and paspas, now shikni is what we say in the north uh, of ah. uh, the Somali region, now known as Somaliland. And paspas is what you might say in the south of Somalia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And... Uh, someone said I was being politically correct by you saying it in that way. But I was just being factual. I call mm -hmm. it shikni. That's how I grew up with it. But it's also called baspas. And therefore, it's important in an article for a news organization to acknowledge mm -hmm. that. Um, was, it about, was it about gender as well or no? No, it, it, it was less... It was less about that. It was more people were very political. I mean, in, okay, the Somali region, and you know well, and you've written about this in you know mm -hmm. in different ways. But um, you know, it's, it's a lot of the issues are rooted in politics, and again, sure. food is inherently political. Um, and this is the thing. Even when I've written pieces, Bhakti from Palermo, when I wrote that piece on the food bank, but also last year I wrote. A piece for the BBC about how African culture is shifting and changing the scene, music, food, etc. In Palermo, you see restaurants, there's a growing scene. I had such strong reaction, even in Italy. I had, you know, fascist blogs write about me saying migrant journalist for BBC News says, it, you know, Palermo is a multicultural hotspot. And I realized, you know, when you talk about food and talk about eating and talk about hair and clothes, it's massively, enormously political and, you know, stating mm -hmm. the obvious almost, but um, people react in really visceral and crazy ways. So, yes, after mm -hmm. I wrote that piece about Somali food for BBC uh, News, I had a lot of tweets, um, which I don't <laughs> want to do, but, um, you know, people say, how dare you describe it as shikni, it's a spaz, you know, um, and people saying, oh, you're just being politically correct by giving both names for this chili sauce. Um, yeah. I, just thought, well, I see. <laughs> so yeah, it's it you know it's unfortunate, but it comes with a territory. But I think it also it, it also shows the amount of um, mm -hmm. 
how much politics is, is, is fused into, you know, food and, and cuisine and cooking. Yeah. So. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we're nearing the end of our time here and mm. I'm going to have Suchitra Vijayan coming up who's, who will speak specifically about uh, South Indian food. But, you know, you were mentioning these various regional issues with pronunciation, but could you divide Somali food into uh, regional types? Is there... Are they very different? That's my final question to you. I think there are better people maybe to ask this question who are more experts, but from my, um, you have to preface everything because someone's going to come for you at some point. <laughs> hey, this, you know. <laughs> but I will say, in short, yes, of course, there are regional differences. Um, mm -hmm. But what are the main components, would you say? I think if, the, the, one of the biggest differences is usually uh, the difference between the nomadic and the so, more settled communities. Mm -hmm. So the nomadic communities, you, you know, all across the country or the Somali region, you're going to find people having much more meat, sort of based diet, um, maybe grains and pulses. And those who are settled usually historically in the southwest of the country, uh, um, you know, fish cookery is, is really significant. But also you have a lot more Swahili influences in the south because mm -hmm. it's on the border with Kenya and it's next to Tanzania. Right. You get much more of Indian Ocean influence. And I suppose that's what Hawa Hassan's book is sort of picking yes. apart. Um, mm -hmm. And in the north, I would say, in Somaliland and the northern region of the Somali region, um, which includes Putland, I would say there's a lot more influences from, from, um, from Yemen. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, it's always a great shame what's happening to Yemen because of course. Yemen is the cradle of so much of the culture in that region. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you really think about marak, which is just essentially meat broth, I mean, that is essentially Yemeni. Um, wow. A lot of the influences that come, you know, from to us uh, came from Yemen. And of course, also in the north, what you have is a lot more influence from Ethiopia and Eritrea um, and the tradition of Ethiopia and the Somali mm -hmm. region of Ethiopia itself. So there are regional differences for sure. And those regional differences really map onto the kind of place that Somalia is in, in the Horn of Africa. It's got the largest coast right. you know, um, um, in, in the whole continent, but also it has these amazing influences. So in the north, you're going to get you know, the Gulf states in the Middle East. Um, mm -hmm. And in the South, you're going to get much more of the Swahili coast uh, and wow. the influence from there. Right. Thank you so much, Ishmael. We are out of time. No worries. Uh, Thank you. But this was, uh, this was amazing. I, I learned so much. And I think people as well, I hope that at least in the U.S. Okay. we get Thank an... You. We get an. I hope in the U.S. we get an influx of Somali restaurants. I know that in London there's more, more, and there's there supper clubs and so yeah. on. Yeah, and drop yeah. me a note uh, because there are lots of blogs and things. I'd be happy to send them your sure. way. Sure, so, I would. Yeah. We would. I would love to share them. Thank you so much, Ishmael. No I'm going on... Thank you, guys. <laughs> Bye. And now I'm going to be joined by Suchitra Vijayan. Uh, here she is. And um, hi, Suchitra. Uh, you wanted to announce uh, some surprises, so we've given you, um, you know, we've given you uh, <laughs> some of our time, and uh, and I'm very very excited to know uh, some of what you're about to announce. I know some of it, I don't know all of it, uh, and you are in your kitchen. You are not. Uh, you are not uh, at at the seat of activism and political analysis as you always are for those no. who those who don't know suchitra vijayan is um is uh, a lawyer okay she's an activist and she's a, a brilliant writer her book came out very recently midnight's border a people's history of india and uh but today uh, as i kept calling it a tasty surprise so why don't you start by telling me what that is so the thing is that Bhakti is also my lucky charm. Uh, Bhakti was also the first person to hear about the, <laughs> the book that became Midnight's Borders almost eight years ago. Um, Bhakti was very pregnant and I think I kind of chased <laughs> her down for five minutes of her time. So uh, it feels like so much has happened and not so much. So um, the surprise is that um, five years ago, um, me and my mother started putting together a cookbook. It's mm -hmm. a recipe, uh, it's a book of recipes that ma, of my grandmother. It's wow. called Suwai. Uh, again, the title comes from Bhakti because Bhakti is great with titles. And it's called The Mother's Inheritance. The book actually <laughs> came as in a really important moment for us as a family. Um, mm -hmm. I was very pregnant. 
um, as a family, we had just gone through some very difficult times. Uh, my mm -hmm. dad had gotten very sick and thankfully gotten better. And when my mom was in New York um, during my second trimester, I think we started having these conversations about my grandmother. Both my grandparents passed away um, when I was barely two months old. So in my mother's mind, she couldn't, she couldn't even believe that she was now in the same age that her mother passed away. And here I was um, pregnant and mm -hmm. I was pregnant with a girl. So I also really wanted to know more about my grandparents and especially my grandmother. Mm -hmm. It became this conversation about recording recipes. For my mother, it was mostly just remembering her mother, mm -hmm. food, recording her recipes. Also, each recipe then very organically became stories about that I had never heard before about wow. our ancestral village, what it meant to raise a family of five children, mm -hmm. um, just the, the, the trauma that most women went through in those times, just trying to fight and struggle to survive the struggle to educate your daughters. Uh, my mm -hmm. aunts were not educated. My mother was being the youngest one, actually was the first one to go to college in our family. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it just became an incredible moment for me right. and my mother. And I was pregnant with my daughter. And right. um, for my mother, it was really about preserving something of her mother's and passing it on to my daughter. Right. And for me, it became more about really mm -hmm. trying to understand who I was, what, who was, right. my, what was my family, who was my grandmother. Mm -hmm. I lost her when I was just a few months old, so I never really grew up with her. Mm -hmm. And um, we put together over, I think, 300, 300 recipes over a period of my second and third trimester. And um, and we narrowed it down. And mm -hmm. it's been in the works for over six years now. So almost, yeah. Mira turns five, Mira just turned five. So almost a little over five years now. Right. Uh, go ahead. And yeah, this is my grandmother. Uh, mm -hmm. My grandmother when she was 16, uh, mm -hmm. married off to my grandfather. I think this is the only photograph of them together after they were married away. Beautiful. I think my, my grandfather was 18 in that picture. So mm -hmm. yeah, this is, it's again, to just imagine that she was only 16 in that photograph and she was married away. Right. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, walk us back slightly and I'm going to ask you two questions. Uh, I know, I didn't know this project had come so far. I remember us um, chatting about titles and things like that. And before we get into the uh, nuts and bolts of the book and I, I, you shared uh, the PowerPoint, Two questions. One, what does Suvai mean? And two, um, is this, you know, Indian cuisine is in a way everywhere, uh, but, you know, it's a very particular type of cuisine that we continually tend to uh, get in restaurants and through chefs and so on. Um, and, you know, I just uh, I just wondered what's, what's different about this. So Subai is, um, I think the closest translation in, in, in English would be taste. To taste, to Subai is, it's, oh, okay. it's taste, it's, it's, it has so many different meanings. Mm -hmm. um, but also my mom comes from um, a community of, of Telugu speaking Naidus um, mm -hmm. from the presidency of Madras, which now is the state of Tamil Nadu. Uh, while we are Telugu speaking for all purposes, it's food that has so much history of migration, of mingling, of coming together. Um, the second thing is also that we are meat eaters, which means that uh, it's mm -hmm. not just your idli, dosas. It's all kinds of food um, from right. appam to idi appam to all, again, with meat dishes, everything not just from mutton. And we actually don't use mutton. It's mostly like mutton and goat to mm -hmm. um, seafood, uh, to the goat intestines. So the point is wow. that also lots of uh, food, um, little birds that no longer exist. It's also understand that as my mom was narrating my grandmother's food, um, it became very clear that a lot of this food that was so important uh, to a land, um, to a farming community, a meat eating farming community, a lot of these dishes no longer exist because we don't have access to these um, either to the kind of grains, either to the kind of meat. So it really is a mixture of so much. Um, it's also an act of migration. So you realize that the food is also not static. The food changes, um, the food mm -hmm. evolves. 
um, from you saying, uh, say, sambal just 70, 80 years ago, you know, changing to using powders like chili powders and then turmeric. Um, mm -hmm. But also it's about cooking for a large family when you had no money. Right. Um, and that's here's my some, grandmother. Here's some beautiful family shots. That's your mom, I think, Suchitra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my grandmother, my grandfather, and that's my mom. Okay. Uh, and so in your, you plan, you're thinking that if you publish this, you will include uh, some of these photos. You're calling it a mother's inheritance. I love this, uh, this, uh, this uh, idea yeah. of an inheritance, you know, that this is an inheritance rather than think of it as kind of monetary, you know, you think of it as a kind of, Inheritance of story, inheritance of memory. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Oh, there's more photos. Tell us what's happening. So that is my grandmother and with my mom, and she was pregnant with me. Mm -hmm. And again, as I said, my grandmother passed away when she was just 60. And this mm -hmm. is my mom, and she turned, she was around 50, 58, 59. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's just, I think for her, losing her mom when she was so young, um, you know, she was... My mom was all of 30. She has just given birth. Um, mm. And I think for me, it was not just the recipes. I think it was also a way for us to think about family histories that right. we never speak about. Mm -hmm. um, how much that women in the family had to fight. Um, there are some really moving moments when I, you know, the stories that my mom told me um, about my grandmother just fighting for us to struggle, to, to stay alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a moment when my grandfather, they, there's, there's, there's a famine. They leave the village to come to the presidency of Madras. My grandfather is in debt. Um, he really says, you know, why don't we take the kids and then go to the ocean? And my grandmother says, no, you want to go kill yourself? You do. But I'm wow. going to sure that I'm going to take care of my kids. Yeah, yeah. And again, I'd never heard the story till I was, you know, and the idea that my grandmother had to fight for that moment for me to be here today was so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, but also well, just the act of getting all of these people, like five children, um, I know. Was, was, yeah, I think it's also like passing on those stories to my daughter. Yeah. Uh, and how does your mother, mother feel? Now, so are, are some of these dishes made by your mom right here? What They're are, all what made are by these? my mom and photographed by my sister. <laughs> I had nothing. I all I did was type up the recipes, and I was I was the I was the I was the foot I was the clerk in all of this process. The real okay. creative genius. My mom cooked, so uh, my mom cooked all of this. So once what is had it? The, so the first one is um, it's it's this um, this is a dish with 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 sour mangoes. Mm. Uh, it's manga korumbu, so which is a very specific taste to it. It's beautiful. The second is green mutton kurma, which my mom makes, which is with green chilies. This is also something that I made for you. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. the other one is prawn fry uh, with root vegetables that goes with rice. So these are the ones wow. in here. Again, all of this, my mom made it. I didn't make it <laughs> and my sister photographed it. So. Is there more? Oh, look here. Uh, we, uh, this is lovely, actually. So tell me a little bit how you plan to, to organize this. And I want to be like totally involved and i want to you know uh you know i, I want to be there when you do, when you put this together i know this is at a proposal stage tell me how you're planning to organize this book so the way i'm organized it is uh first this is Here some is. kind of like a rough recipe index that we put together um mm -hmm. my mom thought about it as you know breakfast lunch dinner meat dishes vegetable dishes what goes with what but I thought what was the really beautiful thing about this is every time my mom would make, say, for example, when my mom was dictating the recipe for, um, say, lemon rice, she would be like, oh, my mom would have this lemon rice with uh, fried potatoes, with sesame oil. Or, so mm -hmm. the point that she's also these little things that come together. There are some really amazing meat dishes, um, mm -hmm. whether it's um, mutton, whether it's brain fry, whether it is, uh, again, they're all done really. The, I think the magic of all of this is it's really simple. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a handful of ingredients. You can put them together really quickly. Um, you know, so my mom thought about this as organizing it as how would you think about food? How would you organize, prepare a meal? So that's how mm -hmm. she was thinking about it. Yeah. Now I am thinking about including little stories uh, along the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's this really great um, anecdote about 
how we never used to have basmati rice. So the first time the family tastes basmati rice is when they invite uh, um, a Muslim cook from Madras is triplicate in to make biryani for like the 25 people in the family. Before wow. that, we used to use siraga samba. So I think those little things are interesting. And mm. how my grandmother would fry bread in ghee and then add it to semia biryani, which is her own innovation. It's not traditional, it's not, you know, but yeah. it's her way of making something not because we are we are meat eating family. So we eat meat at least four, three or four times a week. So what do you do on days when there's no actual meat? So how do you, then you take bread, you fry it in ghee, and then you add it to, mm -hmm. um, yeah. but mostly just, I, I thought my grandma was a very cool person. Yeah, she seems amazing <laughs> and and good on you to make this happen. I wish I could do that for like Marathi coastal cuisine, which is sort of my, which is, mm -hmm. you know, my heritage uh, at the end of the day. And maybe, maybe I will, uh, maybe I'll be inspired. Uh, you know, I, I love the reminder that your family was meat eating, given the nonsense uh, <laughs> going yeah. on in India, of course. Yeah. Uh, and I think one should, you know, I, I do have some Southern Indian cooking books and they're all vegetarian. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's the, you're also going to break kind of the Tambram supremacy, as we say, the yeah. Brahmin. Um, or, or the Chetiyar supremacy, because everybody says Chetinar chicken, right? <laughs> it's like, yes, yes, it's, yeah, it's, very, yeah. it's very yummy, but. Um, yeah, of course. I, I think the mutton fry in our house just takes the cake. It's not Chetinar style, but it still takes the cake anyway. Okay, so that's the next time. So should we, uh, are you, go, are you, you, I see that you're starting uh, a new thing. You're starting an uh, Instagram. Yes. I'm assuming, uh, is your mom going to post or what? Uh, I'm, I have to, once I get to India in a few weeks, I think I'm going to get mom to, um, you know, she's still learning to, you know, she's in this really uh, interesting phase where she's very excited because she's always been very curious. She's constantly collecting recipes and putting it together. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, so it's going to be mostly me and mom. Uh, yeah. And I'm also going to try and convince my sister to post because my sister is also a really, really excellent chef. Um, actually, that's the photograph of me and my sister when we were young with little Shimla hats. Um, yeah. And the other one is of me, my sister and Mira, my daughter. So this was when Mira was, I think, uh, mm -hmm. eight months old. So yeah. all of these pictures also, I think, hopefully will go into the book. Yeah. So you're, you're emerging. Uh, so this is... Uh, underscore Suvai underscore on Instagram. Please follow this account. It's going to be um, amazing. And Suchitra, while you're a very uh, public figure and very much out there, uh, it's interesting for me to, <laughs> uh, to think now that you're going to uh, share pictures of of yourself. And I think uh, you know, just just to to joke, you know, the most Google thing about you is your husband and i insist that you do not show his uh, sh do not post about him you know also also <laughs> don't don't give it don't give them the satisfaction no i also i don't actually post pictures of uh, my my husband or my child it's something that i very consciously do not do mm -hmm. but also when people do search me they, they, for my husband aziz ansari turns up which is not true aziz ansari is not what? <laughs> aziz ansari turns up and he's not my husband <laughs> Oh my gosh. No, he's not. Not at all. I know that. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Please, thank everybody, you. follow uh, Suvai account on uh, Instagram. It's going to be amazing. I hope you're going to uh, post and make it lively. And good luck putting this cookbook together, Sachitra. And thank, thank you. you for this tour de force of the event. Like just listening to all the, you know, Kareem and Ismail and uh, Anita, is, it feels like a masterclass in. Yeah, so much. Thank you. All for things food. Thank Thanks things so much. Food. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Hi, everyone. I'm going to bring uh, Meg Orenberg up. Hi, Meg. Uh, can, I, I know that we are starting right now our focus on Afghanistan. Uh, maybe you can, uh, and we're going to start with your uh, interview first. Do you want to say a little bit? You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, so the first book that we'll talk about is another of our interlink titles, and I'll just hold it up here since um, I don't during the interview. Um, this is Parwana, and I I spoke with Durkane Ayubi about this book um, uh, just last week. Unfortunately, I think it's about 4.30 in the morning where she is in Adelaide, Australia. So um, we're going to 
we're gonna hit the clip and, and listen to that conversation um, pre-recorded. Thanks, Bhakti. Hello, and thank you so much for being here with us for this Radical Books Collective event, Gastropolitics, Gastropoetics. My name is Meg Ehrenberg, and I'm a writer, translator, literature scholar based in Philadelphia, and I'm also managing director of the Radical Books Collective. And I'm delighted to be here with Durkane Ayubi, who is the author of the new gorgeous cookbook, Parwana, Recipes and Stories from an Afghan Kitchen from Interlink Books, and who also works day to day in the uh, in her family's two eating places in Adelaide, Australia, um, Parwana and Kuchi Delhi Parwana. And she's also a freelance writer and a fellow at the Atlantic Institute in Oxford, England. You are so welcome, Darkani. I'm so, I'm so excited to have you here. And um, congratulations on this beautiful book. It's just oh, gorgeous. Thank you. Hello, Meg. It's so lovely to be here. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the discussion and um, thank you for such a warm intro. <laughs> Can you start maybe by just telling us a little bit of the story of Parwana and how it came to be? I mean, I know the title of the book um, comes from the name of your two mm. restaurants, but did you know you wanted to write a cookbook? I mean, why, why this instead of something else? Sure. So, um, if I go back, back, <laughs> how Parwana came into being, you know, my family um, is obviously a migrant family to Australia. Um, we um, moved over as uh, refugees in 1987 via, um, you know, Pakistan. We spent some time in a refugee camp there. The same year I was born in 85, it was a time of the Cold War in Afghanistan where tensions between Soviet Russia and America were playing out on Afghan soil. So this was a time of really great devastation for Afghanistan and its cultural identity. Um, over half the population, um, families like mine, went into exile or, you know, were just um, part of the um, upheaval, lives were lost. So Afghanistan lost a lot of its um, grounding during the 70s and 80s because of the, that war playing out there. Um, so by the time my family got to Australia, you know, we were these um, it was myself, my parents and my siblings. Um, we were all under the age of 10, you know, four young girls, mum and dad. And for the adults who had kind of experienced that displacement and that exile, you know, I'm sure that loss felt so much more palpable and significant. For us as children, um, you know, it obviously is a schism that's gone on to define our life in positive ways as well as challenging ways. But, you know, for my family and I, that connection, that tether to our history and our ancestry in this new place, this kind of very foreign kind of cultural um, surroundings, you know, Know, one part of that was language because we still spoke our language um, growing up but another really important part of that became food and our connection to um, Afghan cuisine and for my mum you know she loved to cook ever since she was a small child so it was kind of embedded in her um, own DNA to kind of want to share um, uh, Afghan food with her own family and then you know from that love that started in the home um, a way to be connected to our own identity that slowly spread out into our community and eventually eventually um, kind of presented itself as Parwana, the restaurant. Um, and it was quite an organic transition from just this real love and um, connection to Afghan cuisine. Uh, and then that becoming a way to share something of our own identity and actually to move forward in our new home um, through that connection to our cuisine. Um, and then the cookbook um, came about because you know we'd thought about it for a little while um but again it just kind of happened when the timing was right um a couple of years ago i started to write it and you know by that point we'd had parwana for about um eight or nine years and um i myself had become really embedded in the traditions of afghan cooking i had learned a lot about it myself i felt like i was in a space to be able to write about it and to write about it in a way that um could expand on the identity of what it is to be Afghan and could, um, it was really important to me to write it in a way that was about 
reclaiming our own stories and reclaiming our own histories because as exiled displaced people from a region of the world that's now been in conflict for decades our identities have been shrunk down to um, narratives of violence and our irreconcilability and um, our penchants for war or else we're sullen passives that need to be ruled you know and so for me the beauty of Afghan cuisine, the history that's embedded within the cuisine, the way it opened up my life, just very on a very personal level as a displaced person, um, became a real conduit, a real um, kind of pathway to open up deeper and broader stories about Afghanistan. And so um, I, I really felt the chance to write the book was this amazing opportunity to kind of extend that ethos that we have at our restaurants of that preservation of our um, cultural heritage. Um, but you know, it's not just about the act of preservation, that act of historical preservation and attachment to our own identity is so that we can contribute to the world in the present and um, create and paint our own future as well. Mm -hmm. You, you paint that movement very beautifully in the structure of the book. Um, and I wonder, I mean, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the way it unfolds, the organization of, of the recipes themselves. I mean, it seems to me, you know, the, um, obviously there's this very beautiful um, narrative that weaves throughout uh, and, and, it it's organized more or less chronologically you start with a deep mm -hmm. uh, a history um of afghanistan and move into this sort of look forward into the future as you've just now described but it seems almost like the ordering of the recipes themselves comes out of those historical and contextual sections and i wonder if you could just talk about that about that decision sure sure, sure. so I actually wasn't interested too much in just writing a cookbook, as funny as that sounds. <laughs> what I was interested in is the narrative. And what I was interested in is food as a conduit to our depths and as a conduit to our reclamation. And so for me, from the very beginning, it felt like I didn't want to, and of course, you know, all of this took place alongside my mom and my sisters, you know, and we talked about um, kind of the recipes we wanted to include and everything. But the way I, and these are all my mother's recipes passed down to her over the generations, right? So in a way, I'm just a vehicle, a vessel to be able to share those recipes. And the way I decided that I wanted to structure it in the book was, you know, the recipes in the same way that food played out in my life as an anchor, as a story, as a connection. Um, you know, I always saw food, and, and this is very much an Afghan cultural thing as well, you know, food isn't just the act of the food that is put out on a spread, you know, embedded within that food are memories and stories and significant moments and rituals. And, you know, it's a proxy for our broader culture and our broader identity. And so to be able to do that story just Justice, um, I wanted to weave the recipes into the narrative and the story that I wanted to share. And so what was very important for me about kind of creating that story was um, I knew that we needed to create context. I knew that we needed to break Afghanistan out of this kind of narrowed prison of the last three or four decades of violence. And I knew through my own personal experience and through what I'd read and been exposed to that there was so much more about Afghanistan that reached back millennia into this beautiful story of ent entwinement and cultural cross-pollination and this real creativity that I think is the gyre, the spinning wheel of the human story and all of these things about our identity had been negated and um, so I wanted to weave the recipes into a narrative that was historical but that also was personal because Afghans tell story according to genealogy and the genealogy I wanted to share was my mother's because these are her recipes and her love for food ultimately that's being expressed here um, in the restaurants and in the book and so I wanted to punctuate the historical moments with moments that were deeply personal from within my own family narrative and then 
another element to the narrative was obviously my own personal voice um, as the writer, as a displaced person who's most, uh, like the, the breadth of my connection to Afghanistan has been an association of exile and I've had to put together lots of missing pieces, you know, and that is the story of what it is to be a displaced person, uh, to be a migrant for people the world over, right? Like our, our identities emerge, not always from what we know, but so much of our identities emerge from the space of what we don't know about ourselves. And so for me, it was a real chance to, yes, tell that story, but also to give myself the opportunity to find those things, those missing stories and missing pieces of my own kind of trajectory here to Australia um, and it ended up being this really rewarding and cathartic experience um, of you know and there's always more to learn and even further to dig but you know just this process of um, putting this story together weaving these recipes into narratives that were historical and contextualizing and that also kind of brought my own family story my great grandparents all the way through to my mother and us and our contemporary experience of our afghan identity um, just became a really powerful way uh, to structure the recipes um, so it wasn't um, you know all the sweets go in one chapter all the kind of mains or meat dishes go in one chapter it was very much you know what does this recipe what does this dish evoke was it a moment in my mother's childhood is it a moment that we as children growing up here felt really connected to our own history because of the dish is it a moment that speaks to the huge kind of um, rich history of Afghan cultural identity, the Zoroastrianism that was born on, you know, what is today considered Afghanistan, you know, so these, so these, for example, the Nauru's recipes, the New Year's recipes are all tethered to that very ancient history. And I thought, you know, it's a chance to tell a story in a way that is much more interesting and much more contextualizing um, for me and also hopefully for people engaging with the book. <laughs> I was I was going to you know I was going to prompt you to talk about those exact things about that movement between the sort of huge large scale of you know the historical expanse of shifting imperial control and so forth global politics and then this much more intimate scale of your own family history. Um, I mean was there a lot of research that that went into to the writing? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I spent a long time reading before I did any writing. And um, one thing I was really adamant about, which ties into this idea of the reclamation of the story of Afghan cultural identity was to change the sources. So I didn't want to just use written material that has been produced about Afghanistan, where Afghan people are subjects of um, study. Um, and, uh, you know, where we're kind of consigned to identities that are about our tribalism and and you know nothing more right and these are these really ossified identities these unchanging unmoving identities and that is in reality what most of the literature about Afghanistan is and so I thought well I don't want to base this um, the story of Afghan culture and cuisine and my own personal identity on those sources so I started to and I was very lucky in a way that, you know, my own family were people who had written kind of essays and academic pieces and poetry and works of philosophy and that kind of thing that spoke to um, the truth and the um, reality of the Afghan experience. And so, for example, you know, my mother's mother, um, my grandmother is um, a poet and a feminist whose work is still in print in Afghanistan. So I found those poems and I said, Sat with my mum and we translated them. So I wanted to use these primary sources that were straight from Afghan people's kind of own visions of themselves. Um, my mother's first cousin is, um, his name is Baudin Majur, and he was a writer, um, an academic and a journalist who had traveled and studied all throughout the world, but who was 
ultimately very concerned about, you know, how does Afghan identity get preserved through the upheavals of communism in the 70s and 80s? And, you know, just an example of um, one or two of his works, he wrote this beautiful epic poem called um, Ajdai Khudi, which means ego monster. And it was all about the kind of collapsing identity of Afghan people because of the kind of atheism of communism that was very alien to Afghan identity, warring with and sparking this very extreme uh, version of Islam, which was, you know, that radicalization, that extremism that began in the 70s and 80s was also very alien to Afghan identity. So, you know, he was really concerned about this middle way, like how do we come out of this conflict with Afghan depth and Afghan cultural aura still intact? And so he wrote these amazing kind of academic papers as well as poetry and literature and philosophy on all of these things. He was interviewed by people from all around the world, from the Atlantic, the New Yorker, et cetera, just to try and get a, a better picture of what was happening in Afghanistan during, during those times. So I went out of my way to find these sources and some of it involved, um, you know, picking up a phone and my phone and calling um, Bahuddin Majro, my uncle's son, who, who now, you know, lives in California and asking for um, copies of his papers, things I hadn't seen. Um, some of it was sitting with my mum and translating things that had been passed through the family or her brothers and sisters had copies of. So, yeah, it was definitely... Um, I was motivated to um, ensure that a fuller picture of the Afghan experience, um, a stronger basis of any stories I wanted to tell could emerge because I was resorting to and using sources that were written by and for us, not about and over the top of us. Mm -hmm. That's such an incredible story. I mean, how often do we imagine that uh, poetic translation would be the process to, to the writing of a cookbook. I mean, <laughs> I'm really lucky. I felt really special. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, has that prompted you to imagine doing more with those with those poems? How what an incredible experience are they? Were they otherwise untranslated or? Um... Yeah. Yeah, there's, you know, there's just this, this rich kind of archive of um, literature and poetry that would, you know, for me, even just kind of beginning to unsurface it, um, gave so much more depth and layers and context to, um, uh, you know, my own experience and my own um, identity that, yeah, it's definitely kind of sparked, you know, what more I can do with that work and, you know, in any kind of writing and um, speaking that I do, you know, kind of moving forward, um, I've only been more emboldened to resort to that kind of um, literature and those sources because, you know, it does multiple things. It counteracts this myth about um, Afghan identity, which is, you know, that we don't have our own intellectual histories, that we don't have our own kind of visions for ourselves, that we were always beholden to um, the violence, that the violence and the war and the ruling over us is inevitable, right? Because those are all um, kind of tropes that are used unchanged to this day. Um, they were the tropes that sparked the war on terror or, you know, justified it. You know, we'll go in to save the women, we'll go in to liberate the people, you know, and those those things can take ground and can take hold when the common dominant belief is that we don't have anything of our own, <laughs> you know, and so that there's nothing to lose and that we should be ruled and directed in our own lives. It takes away our agency completely. So by going to these sources and this literature that says, no, hang on a minute, we know who we are we know the depth and the extent of our own histories and how special that is and you know not to kind of promote exceptionalism of any sort but just to say you know we've had the complete opposite of that pasted over our identities and so um for me as an you know as a migrant living in australia at this moment in time you know after it was always important i wrote the book before um everything, the collapse of um, the Afghan kind of state that happened just this year. But, you know, now it's even more important to me that those narratives are resurfaced and that, you know, we tell stories of ourselves in a way that is grounded in ourselves, because that's the only way we can actually imagine 
a future um, that is alive and not kind of deadened and um, hopeless. Yeah. You you talk specifically in chapter four about that uh, that plight of the displaced, um, and I and you and you you refer to food as a source of healing um, mm. in that chapter and how important it was for your mother whose recipes you know are, are populate the book to hold on to those food ways and to share them um, with your generation now growing up in um in a new place in australia um and i'm wondering if you imagine your book extending that healing to other migrants and refugees i mean what what work do you hope the book might do is already doing potentially in communities like your own um in adelaide yeah you know um i think of course my hope and our hope as a family for the book is um that it can break through those silences about afghanistan and i don't mean silences as in a lack of words there's so much being said about Afghanistan. But what's being said about us takes us away from any possibility of a future that is in our own hands as Afghan people, right? And so, you know, the book has already done really incredible things. And, you know, as a writer, my first job is to write from a place that is very personal because that's my experience right but i also believe that when you can kind of get to the heart of your own experience and share that as stripped bare of any kind of distractions or um kind of distortions as possible then that's bound to resonate with other people you know whether it be other afghan people living as exiles and displaced all over the world whether it's afghans still struggling within afghanistan whether it is other refugee and migrant communities who aren't afghan you know there are so many kind of universal elements of that story of displacement and loss and starting again and you know it's not just a story that is um i guess about loss alone it's a story about rebuilding and about the binaries that are and the dualities that are at the heart of the human experience right like that act of loss that we faced as a family that millions of people all around the world are facing daily now because of the way our global politics and global notions of power are constructed, that loss of your own connection to your own homeland and the place where all your ancestral memories exist was also a chance for us to rebuild, you know, to have this connection to cuisine, to have um, a future. And for me as an Afghan person, knowing my history and part of kind of knowing that history was what I got to research and the depths I kind of had a chance to go into through the research of the book, I feel increasingly this sense of responsibility to do something with the life um, I've had um, that isn't just about, you know, me, but that is about um, very much honouring and bringing to the fore, um, you know, the the elements of Afghan identity that we need um, as a basis to be able to construct our own future. And so, yeah, you know, I guess I can only hope that the book um, sparks conversations um, that are different to the ones that are being had about Afghanistan, where, where it's hopeless and Afghan people are being blamed for all the failures that the world kind of transposed onto it, where, you know, I hope that it can create conversations that see a future that's grounded in, um, you know, our own agency, our own intellectual histories, our own arts, our own visions. And, you know, it's already kind of had those um resonances for me in that i've been able to engage uh, with my own community through it um, i've had messages from afghan diaspora all over the world saying um you know that this is something that they personally feel like very um, attached to because they see their own story in it, their own grandparents in it, their own family's histories in it. And it's something that they can share with others in their community, wherever they are, to say, well, you know, hang on a minute, here's all these other things that, you know, we can share about Afghan identity. Um, and just even conversations like this that I've been able to have now all over the world. Um, 
has been, you know, to me speaks to the power of, um, yes, cuisine and how it's a proxy for our history and our culture and so much more. Um, but also it just speaks to the ability to connect with people outside in ways that haven't yet been imagined because it is in one way a reclamation of my own story and just from that as a basis and you know i'm not saying it's perfect or complete i think it will be lifelong work for me to always keep excavating always find out new things always make connections but really by exploring cuisine in this contextualized way, what it's allowed me to do is write Afghanistan into the story of the world, because it allowed for these kind of cross connections, these parallel histories of different things that were happening in different parts of the world, but with Afghanistan at the center, as, as a story told through Afghan eyes, to have, start to have very different conversations um, to the dead ends that we're being led down um, because of the dominant narratives around Afghanistan. You've 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 spoken so much about the the incredible um, archival work that this has been, both in your your own family archives and and beyond. Um, but I wonder if you were were you also reading cookbooks as you were writing it? I mean, well, did you have models or maybe even models that you were avoiding as you as you? That's so interesting. Um, I've been asked this question once before, and when I was asked it, it kind of surprised me because I thought about it and I thought, no, I didn't necessarily need this to be a reconstruction of a cookbook. I mean, obviously, I um. I wasn't going to get completely out there and have it like not a cookbook that you could follow. And it was really important to me that, you know, we tried to make the recipes as clear as possible and as easy to follow as possible and that kind of thing. Um, and I suppose being from a food family and um, being somebody that's always kind of been ex immersed in food, um, I have had exposure to different cookbooks and that kind of thing. So I'm sure that subconsciously that's all there as I'm writing this book. But I really didn't go out of my way to structure it according according to, um, I mean, I admire lots of cookbooks, but I didn't really feel this was a project that needed to um, emulate, um, you know, a, a style of a cookbook. I really felt that this needed to be first and foremost about how to tell the, um, as complete as possible as I could tell and as contextualized as possible as I could tell the story of Afghanistan through its beautiful um, cross pollinated beautiful cuisine right like how could I tell that story and then um, I had wonderful guidance from um, you know my publisher and my publisher team and my own family and so obviously there's lots of discussion and kind of um, thoughts around what, what recipes are important to include, what we don't want to include, that kind of thing. But for me, it was really a chance to be totally, um, well, not totally because everything is kind of based on things you've seen and read before, but creative in the sense that um, just be being unrestricted in how I wanted to weave that story and, and still have a really great cookbook um, together. <laughs> it really seems like it. The, the oh. content that moves the 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 flow of the of the book mm -hmm. was there was there anything that you ended up having to leave out that you wanted in the book that you couldn't um mm -hmm. that you to include yeah i think you know um some things were about like um word count restrictions so first in the kind of essay thing uh, chat bits that um are the uh, pretext to the chapters the, to the recipes, um, I had to think very carefully about, you know, um, the extent of the history I wanted to go into. And I remember, for example, the chapter where I'm talking about, you know, the more contemporary issues in Afghanistan. Um, I thought, well, you know, I have to, like, I want to, for this story to be complete, I need to talk about, you know, the emergence of radical extremism and, for example, the, the foothold of the Taliban and the history of that foothold. 
but then I also, and you know, that gave me a really huge word count. And, but then I also kind of had to start to be selective about how can I tell that story and, the, and retain the importance of how that came to be and that impact of that on Afghanistan and its story, but still, you know, strip away the bits about it that were perhaps a little too kind of complicated for the nature of a cookbook. So I had to make those kind of um, editorial decisions about what to leave out. Um, and then also in the recipe selection, um, we had like a huge list when we first started. And then we thought, well, you know, uh, we kind of wanted to strip it back to recipes that maybe meant something to us that we had kind of cooked here as a family that kind of punctuated moments in our own personal history. Um, and that were easy for people to follow as well, because there are some recipes that are, say, very traditional. Um, and, you know, all the recipes we put in there are kind of very, um, Afghan traditional recipes that my mother grew up with, but, you know, we had to think about um, some things are just way too complex and will never actually be cooked by most people around the world. So they'll have this kind of cultural historical value. And so, for example, I might just talk about them. Um, certain dishes like the moliba, which is like a festive dish, but it's literally just kind of making bread and like um, using your hands to get it into really fine bread crumbs and then adding kind of a oil and sugar and cardamom to it and that's a very afghan dish that you have at weddings and like on eid or at celebratory events but many most people probably wouldn't cook it so i can describe it and allude to the importance of it in our culture but then as a decision of a cookbook that we still want to be functional and usable in everyday life for most people then there was a decision to kind of take those recipes out well Maybe as just like a final question, because we're we're starting to get to the end of our time. Um, I mean, your prose is very beautiful in this way. And you mentioned to us that your grandmother um, was a poet and you have other poets in your in your family. And I, I just wonder if you like for you, is there any relationship between writing and cooking? I mean, is there a, is there <laughs> is there a poetic connection here for you? Uh, that's a really lovely question and I think the obvious answer is yes because I you know put together a cookbook with food as the kind of crux of um, the story I wanted to tell but at, I think I, I know what you're getting at and at a deeper level for me food is narrative mm -hmm. food is story and it's not necessarily a verbal narrative until you start to put it into words. But the reason that I think it's become such a natural and organic part of my life as somebody who loves to understand the story and the why and the context and, you know, the elements of it that are connected to me and my own expression of being human. Um, you know, I see the cuisine as this non-verbal narrative that has bypassed so much kind of prejudice in my own life. I see it happening every day in our restaurants as people come in to eat and the conversations I can have with people. I see it as a non-verbal narrative that raises people's understanding about Afghanistan without them even realizing that that's what's happening. <laughs> and I've seen it as a non-verbal narrative that ultimately is about the things we all share in the human condition, right? At a very elementary level, we all need to eat. But on a deeper level, you know, food is about coming together. It is about an exchange of moments. It's about creating memories and significant kind of events with the people that we care and and love care about and love, right? And so for me, because food is all of these things, it was very easy to kind of weave that into a verbal story, a, a, a language, because it really is its own language waiting to kind of be translated into words. <laughs> and so I've loved that kind of ability to express myself um, my whole life now through food and with hindsight, you know, in ways that were very significant as we're all kind of gathered around mum as kids, you know, just 
thinking we're going through the motions or just having fun all together and being silly as kids all together you know they were actually moments that defined me and embedded the beauty of food as narrative into my story and brought me to this point where um, I really was passionate about telling that story um, of food. Um, so yeah, I, I think food is a language. It's a love language. It is, um, it just reveals so much to us about us and about the human condition. What a beautiful way to end. Um, Jakana, thank you. I am I am so excited to, to cook from this book. That's what I haven't done yet, is I haven't tried any of the recipes. <laughs> um, but after this conversation, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so do take care. Thank you for being with us. And um, I hope this won't be the last time. <laughs> Thanks so much, Meg. Thank you, Meg. Thank you. Uh, Durkanai for that incredibly eloquent, beautiful conversation. I'm going to continue our focus on Afghanistan because uh, it's, uh, of course, a difficult place, a complicated place. And I'm being joined here by Zora Saeed. Hi, Zora. You're muted, I think. Um, Hi, how are you? I'm very good. Thank you for coming. Um, you know, we just heard, uh, we just heard from uh, uh, an Afghan chef and writer in um, Australia. And uh, now here we are in the US, the gross perpetrator of all the problems in a way in Afghanistan. And I was hoping that before we started to talk about food, uh, that we should just honor and acknowledge some of the things that are going on. And for those who uh, don't know, um, I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give a quick intro. It's very hard for me to introduce you because I have known you since graduate school. That's like 2001. And that was like 9-11 and all mm -hmm. the crazy troubles. Uh, Zora Saeed is a poet. That's what I know you first as, is a writer, is a scholar. Uh, you also run uh, Upset Press, a uh, beautiful what you call uh, micro press in, uh, based in Brooklyn. I've had the honor of working with you uh, at this press. Um, and uh, one of the things I know about you and many people who know about you as a public person is that you cook incredible food and you post about it, you write about it, you, uh, you know, it's not tutorials necessarily, but certainly some sort of advice or some way in which you are keeping, uh, I believe, Uzbek Afghan food um, alive. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But let me let me start by uh, let me start by uh, what we promised, which was uh, a focus on Afghanistan. Your family was also displaced mm -hmm. from, from Afghanistan in the late 80s, just like Ayubis. Uh, and you came to the U.S. as a child fleeing war. And here we are again, one more time, another wave of horror, violence. Um, and I want to ask you to tell us a little bit more about the work you've been doing. Oh, you must be in New York. Uh, I just wanted to ask you to uh, tell us a little bit about the work you've been doing to raise awareness uh, about the situation. Uh, what do you think uh, needs to happen um, urgently right now? Yeah, the situation is quite urgent. Um, Afghanistan is facing um, one of the worst humanitarian crises in 43 years. So uh, there will be food shortages and there's um, prices have gone up 10 times for food. It's quite desperate. And I think one of the cruelest things in all of this chaos of evacuation, you know, sort of accepting the, the Taliban has been um, abandoning the Afghan people, right? Um, so there are many movements now to have a, a petition sign to have um, activism uh, sort of get people out to speak about this to get Biden to release about 1.5 million at least of those frozen money uh, for Afghan people. There's another one to release humanitarian aid. There's many attempts at different fronts of the diaspora to push 
um, um, and, and allies of Af Afghan people um, to push and get the government to uh, and the world to release funds for uh, Afghans and humanitarian aid. Uh, so that's what we're looking at, food shortage in a country that was dependent on uh, humanitarian aid from the outside world for these 20 years. Um, it's it's quite uh, um, it's it's quite upsetting to That's, absolutely yeah, yeah. absolutely uh, and I know that you've been uh, you know the you ha you were featured in the New York Times and I know you've been doing interviews trying to uh, uh, raise uh, awareness and uh, you know as the situation is as dire it is we've also had a whole conversation today on migration and cuisine, which often gets into more romantic uh, notions of mm. understanding places. So on the one hand, we have terrifying questions of hunger and starvation uh, and war um, and all the things that displacement and violence brings. And then we also have this long memory of food, the desire to archive and to strengthen lineages of food that we're literally seeing maybe getting erased as we speak. Uh, in a way, uh, Durkanai Ayubi was very clear that her book Parwana is a history book. So how, how do you place, say, projects of food and culinary histories on this kind of contradictory spectrum? Hmm. I think that's an excellent, an excellent question because what we're looking at is, um, you know, there is a, a an, an valid and beautiful story of food within families and sort of preserving, and that's the nature of cookbooks, right? Kind of um, sharing that that the warmth of the hearth, right? Um, identity that's cultivated around these foods. That's also uh, part of food. I look at the other side, which is a little more trauma-based uh, or sort of war-based. You know, in these migrational movements, Afghanistan being like a crossroads of Asia, and in the mixing of the different kind of cuisines in Afghan food, you see uh, really that it is what, uh, you know, what Afghanistan usually called the navel of Asia. You really see those, the multiple footprints of kinds of foods, dumplings, rice, bread, uh, kebabs, roasted meats, things of that sort. So, um, but a lot of the, the um, movement of foods in and out of Afghanistan were a result of war and displacement, um, like Dorhane talks about her own family's experience. But um, many generations, and my own uh, family history is uh, my great grandparents and grandparents, my grandparents came as children as refugees uh, to Afghanistan. So they brought their food, they brought the cuisine. Uh, in the 1930s, there was a movement of Uyghurs who came. Uh, to um, because China became a communist country, so they were displaced and they were moved. Uh, they fled to Afghanistan, India, and Afghanistan, and they brought a lot of the the dumpling dishes as well. So um, you have a very interesting collection, and I see in the diaspora this mixing of um, you know all these foods. Uh, and it's become sort of like a set diaspora type of food. You have the mantu, you have this, you have that, the mm -hmm. rice and the palau and things, but where. In Afghanistan itself, it's important to kind of look at how those foods came in and became part of this diaspora mm -hmm. regular kind of table. Sorry right. to go on. <laughs> no, no, you haven't it's gone The problem on. of being a lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, happy to have you say as much as you want. One of the things we were thinking of uh, when we were talking about uh, this event was also saffron. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, that's something, uh, you know, that's something that Afghanistan seems to uh, even even Kashmir um, within the Indian context, you, you're losing kind of fields of saffron because of all these things. And you're losing these important, intensely, um, you know, conflicted crops, but at the same time, like very precious, very important, um, you know, uh, eco diversity type of uh, things as well. Is there, uh, you know. Is there is there is that something you've been thinking about? Is are there more such um, ingredients or crops that are we're going to expect that they will suffer? Or well, I have a really um, yes, yeah, saffron for sure. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of also of grapes. I'm thinking mm -hmm. also of hing, right? Which is asafetida. Oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. So, but I'm thinking more. The more you know, hing is uh, um, is never a great great thing to have in a factory anyway, but I don't know. Uh, but the saffron and the grapes, of, during the, the 20 years of the um, Soviet-Afghan War, one of the things that was lost was grapes. 
Wow. Um, and grapes uh, had actually the kind of grapes that were brought for sort of winemaking to the U.S. in mm -hmm. the 1920s was actually from um, Avonistan. So what happened was that winemakers in California during the sort of, uh, um, you know, post-2002 sort of reconstruction of Avonistan, they brought back the grapes to replant in Afghanistan again. So Afghanistan had their grapes again. Saffron in the same way was developed again as well. And it's known as one of the best uh, saffrons in the world. The only unusual thing about uh, Afghanistan saffron companies was that I was trying to find a company that was not military uh, connected mm -hmm. um, to buy saffron and use here. But it was very hard because the very famous ones that are distributing saffron to the US are connected to um, military or former military. So it gives it a little bit of um, bad taste, I'd say. But yeah. the danger is, the yeah. danger is that we're losing it. And you see it already. There was a story my friend who's been evacuating a lot of Afghan uh, writers and poets told me, which was, it just really broke my heart. Uh, there was one evacuee who was waiting in Pakistan and then another one that was being evacuated. And the one in Pakistan asked if they could bring saffron to mm -hmm. Pakistan. And so they came with saffron and they met, even though, even though they never knew each other, they'd never met each other. And they had this beautiful moment around the saffron. And I don't know how long we'll have that saffron considering what's happening in Afghanistan now. But Wow, I know. It's so depressing. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move to you now. Uh, because uh, I'm so excited to talk about all the things you do. You're a poet, you're an activist, educator, you run this press and uh, you're super busy, but I always see you like sort of making a very Zen time to cook. And I, and uh, what strikes me is that it's very particular cuisine. You know, you don't just kind of uh, stick a picture of a whatever, like, like, like a salad and say, Hey, you know, this is what I made. Uh, it's, it's informational. Uh, there is a, there is a political project in there. Yeah. Um, firstly, where does all the cooking fit with all your work? Do you see it as part of like, is in communion with everything you do? Yeah. I, um, it is my Zen time. Um, <laughs> for me, cooking came, um, from fathers we didn't have actually most of the women in my family didn't know how to cook so they learned it from their husbands or they learned it when mm -hmm. from their fathers so i find that a really interesting story to tell although we always assume the kitchen to be a female space but mm -hmm. but i think that's because my own family history is about several layers of migration so they all had to learn how to everyone had to learn how to cook, not just, mm -hmm. it wasn't just females. There wasn't that luxury of having that, you know, patriarchal structure where women stayed home and men worked and things like that. So wow. uh, I think that added to a particular type of relationship. But for me, um, in Afghanistan, we are, you know, part Uyghur that also came from um, uh, uh, sort of um, during the 1930s and 40s, right, during the partition of India, a lot of Uyghurs came from India but into Afghanistan. So mm -hmm. you have this um, community uh, that, you know, so Uzbek, Uyghur, and other groups are marrying one another. And so that's the kind of background I come from. Um, so the foods wow. I have are very different. But then we were also in Jalalabad in the northeast of Afghanistan. We had just incredible vegetarian dishes that I think I'm grateful for because um, Turkic cuisine did not have a lot of vegetables. So <laughs> this is where I get the okra and uh, the gulpi, yeah. the cauliflower and all the um, other foods. So I think Afghan cooking is regional, but I was lucky in that I was able to bring mm -hmm. my family history brings together, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, Turkic food and also um, Eastern, uh, Eastern Afghanistan food as well, which is, you know, has a, it was where Gandhara was. So it was the old wow. uh, seat of um, Buddhist and Hindu mm -hmm. uh, cultures. So you have that in the food. You know, there's something like um, shaftal, which we definitely can't get here. Shaftal is like a clovers, but my dad talks about, and he longs for this thing. This is what my dad longs for is um, a, a clover dish, a green dish, and it's just really fresh and beautiful. Uh, but there's no way we can do it here unless we farm it in Jersey somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> you know, happy. that's always a possibility. Um, so, you know, like Afghan food, because I'm Indian, of course, uh, always belongs within a South Asian. There's a part of it that belongs within a South Asian um, kind of heritage, culinary history. Uh, but I know that what you do is fuse it with the Central Asian 
um, uh, Central Asian uh, history, which is, you know, much less known within the English speaking world. Uh, and I think uh, your your family is your your Uzbek. And could you tell me a little bit about how that cuisine is um, not different, but, you know, how you know how it connects with that particular hemisphere or that region? Yeah, so um, I think with um, even South Asian food, there's a lot of Mughali influence. So that, yes, you know, Babur was from Farhana, so which is where my family is from too. So mm -hmm. you have that mixing. And I think that's a perfect way of describing it between Central Asia and South Asia. And of course, even the kebab, we know the kebab comes from the Sumerian word kababu, which is to burn. So that has that, uh, you know, West Asian, uh, Middle Eastern root. Um, so it is a place that has multiple mixings and I see it in even the dumpling dishes like mantu, you would have zira, uh, cumin, mm -hmm. and you would have black pepper and onions, which is very different in presentation than um, well, Uzbek presentation of mantu, oh, that's samsa. Oh. My food is being featured and the naan I made, <laughs> apparently the bottom one I burnt a little bit as it was noted <laughs> by a friend on Twitter. Do you, do you but, remember during uh, early COVID, me frantically being like, I'm going to bake because like everyone's baking and you tried to guide me through naan and it did not work out for me. Oh, it so, uh, I think it I just hoard cookbooks. I don't uh, I think maybe I'm not like particularly good at the cooking okay. part. But uh, what what the is live this? session. <laughs> exactly. Um, so samsa this is in samsa. traditional shape. Yeah. So which samsa. is like the samosa. Yeah, so samsa is, uh, oh, it's going so fast. I'm getting hungry. No, no, I'm, I'm so, going to come back because I think we should have put these two together. So here's the triangle. And oh, then yeah. this is a different kind of naan. Oh, there's, I mean, I'm a terrible cook. Look, it's all like misshapen. So most of my food is misshapen. Oh. But in the stomach, everything is the same. So it doesn't matter, right? So, um, yeah, so I do make naan. I do, I do continue cooking in that way that weaves together the different uh, traditions that I have because I do think that, um, I don't know how to explain it. It is part of my work. I write about Central Asian food cuisine. I talk about migration. I talk about war. You know, most of these cuisines are done or uh, influenced by moments of abundance, right? Mm -hmm. Wheat, um, moments of um, um, uh, star starvation or, or sort of uh, lack of food, right? Which mm -hmm. is when we add like potatoes in with the mantu, which is something specifically from those Turkic communities that came as refugees to um, uh, Afghanistan. So that combination of, you know, filling in when there was a, they had gone through a moment of famine, replacing meat with potatoes or mixing meat with potatoes wow. is something that we still do, but it comes from this moment, a traumatic moment, right? Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, the thinness of the dough that you need for samsa versus, you know. Yeah. yeah. So when you say traditional shape, it's a, it's a square. Yeah, usually it's, it's a square. It's a nice square shape. Mm -hmm. But, okay. um, you know, Let, I, I'm getting nervous because there's chefs around. So I don't worry. But, uh, <laughs> They're learning from you. Yeah, well, so sweet tea. And Look then this, this is actually oh this is a pierogi thing yeah. my friend Yana gave me. Uh, who I adore and she told me um, no she told me where to get it and so we did it together and she taught me and mm -hmm. I use it as an easy way of making chuchwara shurwa chuchwara mm -hmm. shurwa is like chuch means like the nada yeah those are gigantic tortellini things that I made but that's Wait, what chuchwara I, is yes no hold on I, I thought we had there is, is one it? yes there that is one. the finished yes this look one. that's it that's it being boiled Ah, okay. So in the simmered in the stew in the the soup itself. Mm -hmm. So these little they're supposed to be much smaller. I feel a little embarrassed. I mean, if any, you know, <laughs> I am a home cook. Zara, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's when all the, the rage. It's all the rage. Uh, and uh, let's talk about the mantu. This seems oh, so to be the mantu. The I, yeah, well, mantu it means mantug. So I not. So you see mandu in the Korean tradition. That sort of is during Mongolian era. There were a lot of Uyghurs in Korea. So you have some mixing of vegetables. And then it comes back to Uzbekistan later on during mm -hmm. the Soviet era. You have the Korean influences of kimchi and things here. But this, I made a whole wheat one. It looks, it, it's, I have to say my food, my cooking is ugly now that I think about it. But it tastes good. Zora, um, we're not going to have a therapy session here. This is beautiful, gorgeous, <laughs> gorgeous food. And, you know, I've only eaten one, two. Uh, I think it was like Armenian, but I had it in Syria uh, and in Lebanon. Yeah, but it, it wasn't like this. It looked different. 
Uh, I think there's all, so many shapes, perhaps. Very, very. There are a lot of variations. Ah, the Armenian maybe is the Georgian, uh, Hale, wait, Halinka? No, Khenkalis, which I keep calling Halinka, which is wrong. Khenkalis, yeah. which have like 18 folds. So mm -hmm. there are ways to make it beautiful. This is a very simple one. I cheated and used a wonton wrapper for that because if okay. you're busy. But when I'm when it's COVID, I made whole wheat ones that looked kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Avon version this? will, uh, the Uzbek version will not have anything on it except yogurt. Um, it won't have like anything. And, and sometimes they make it quite large. Um, and, but the turkey, uh, in Turkey, manta is very small and tiny yes. and in a bigger yogurt sauce. And then dushwara in Lebanon, which takes also warak means a leaf. So mm -hmm. knotted leaf is what the word is, dushwara or chichwara, um, means, um, so in Lebanon, there's a smaller version too, I guess, because of the Ottomans. So you have variations of it, but the dry one with just yogurt on it is the Uzbek version. The mm -hmm. Afghan version will have like a lentil chickpea korma, meaty korma on top of it. Mm. Uh, so it's like a little more like a stewy based, right? right. So and this is the chichwara. It's supposed to be a soup. Yeah. I didn't, I don't like too many liquids in my soups. I just... Oh. <laughs> It's a non-soup soup. I love it. It's a it. chunky. It's a chunky. Uh, see, you're getting an outpouring of sympathy. Thank Annie you. Girl, who also makes incredible food and posts about it. Uh, she has given you a stamp of uh, approval Thank right you. there. Thank you. Chef Dalo, um, yes, too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what what's happening here? Oh, Uzbeki Palau. Mm, yum. Oh, so Uzbeki Palau is pretty simple. So th there are variations of Palau, of course, biryani, Palau, mm -hmm. and... Mm -hmm. Pull off. Um, we use a long grain rice because we're uh, used to the long grain. Uh, it seems mm -hmm. like in uh, Uzbekistan now there's a lot of short grain rices that are used. Mm -hmm. I think it had something to do with land being used for just making a big statement, but I hope I'll back it up with research. But during Stalin's like uh, cotton craze, and he was like obsessed with being the lead in cotton, there were a lot of like wheat and and sort of uh, agricultural lands that were taken over by cotton. So I have mm -hmm. an idea that the short grain race comes from that because we're used to very long grain rice. And so we use basmati and then mm -hmm. the Uzbeki Palau version is sort of like a easier version than the Kabuli Palau, which is everything is separate. The carrots mm -hmm. are cooked separate, the, ra the raisins separate, and the dish yeah. separate. Um, and so uh, we do it all in the beginning, which I think is an easier way for like a busy home cook. Sure. And then you can put like either, um, what's behe? Oh my God, what is a behe? What is that thing that's between a pear and an apple? What is that fruit? I don't know. A, between a pear and an apple. What is a behe? Can anyone, someone who knows Farsi, behe? Okay, anyway. Uh, <laughs> so it's a, um, it's like not, chunky. Not a guava, I hope. No, but you cook it. So you either put a garlic clove, like a whole mm -hmm. head of garlic in the center, or you could put apple, or you could put rhubarbs, long strips of rhubarb on top. So yeah. it's, you're creating the uh, sort of side condiment thing with the rice mm -hmm. itself. And it's sort of like, I like yeah. fast ways of cooking things because sure. I don't have too much time. So Sure. Uh, and I was telling Ismail before, um, and I'm telling you, it's time to write that volume, you know, you, sh you should write it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me, let me, let's move away a bit from making people hungry and <laughs> have their mouths water from all the pictures. And uh, the last few minutes, I just want to focus a bit on uh, Diaspora, you know, mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, we have spoken a little bit about diaspora in terms of keeping, keeping the culinary heritage and memories alive and circulating and in transmi uh, transmission. Uh, I guess restaurants are important conduits in a way. We were thinking, Zora, even to feature perhaps uh, someone who runs a restaurant, you know, before mm -hmm. when we were talking about this. Um, and I always, I love this and I hate Not this at the same time, which is uh, apricot. Not okay. apricot. No, no. Oh, somebody's saying <laughs> Thank you, that. though. No, behe is, um, I still don't know what it is. It's like yeah. a, it's like an apple mm -hmm. pear. Okay. It'll come. Uh, okay. Let's talk about restaurants. Yeah. I, you know, I, I was saying that it's, it's, it's um, despairing, but it's also intense at the same time that migrants come and they'll start restaurants. Yeah. Right? So what's, uh, you, know, what, tell, you, you live in the U.S., uh, you live in uh, New York. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the food scene in the U.S.? What is the Afghan food we're eating? Like for Indians, uh, it's always uh, this very particular North Indian food that passes as Indian food. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'd never heard of like mango lassi or like uh, balti chicken or whatever. It's quince. 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 Okay. Thank you, Anya. 
<laughs> there it is. <laughs> what yeah, is the well. Afghan food that we're getting? So, I mean, I think it's still, I, I feel like it's like sort of Maimoni food. It's like sort of party food you're getting. Um, so it's like you're getting the kebabs, you're getting, you know, a very fancy type of rice that takes a long time. It's not my easy way of making uh, palau, so it's much more careful. So you are getting sort of celebratory foods at the restaurant. You know, the mantu has a lot of sauce on it, so it's much more decadent than I think uh, traditional. But things are missing, like a bomia korma, which is like something Jalalabad mm -hmm. has a lot of. Like, we don't really see too much of those, or like gulpi. Mm -hmm. uh, some places will have it now because it's more popular to have vegetarian stuff um, or like, you know, um, region, like really regional areas. You'll have some names that sort of sig signal that mm -hmm. uh, like, ba was it Balch? Yeah, Balch Shish Kebab in Astoria, mm -hmm. which is a northern wow. cuisine. So they'll have, you know, a very distinct type of kebabs that'll be mm -hmm. different than other parts and size and shape as well. Um, you have like kebabistan in Arlington, Virginia, which is uh, like Afghan Turkmen and Afghan Uzbek food, which I think is great, fantastic. So I would, you know, go there for that. And then there's a place called Nonsense, which I think operates only during in New York, only during, um, I think the uh, those those night uh, food. What is that when Queens when they have like the it's at night and then everyone can. Kind of, yeah. Night bazaars, night bazaar. <laughs> sure. So it's sort of a drifting, moving uh, thing, but yeah. nonsense as a non. Yes. And then Sammy's kebab in Queens. These are my places I was supposed to have mentioned. So I'm doing my, <laughs> my advertisement. My yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But course. they do, yeah, and they do become cultural centers because that's where we go mm -hmm. um, to meet. That's where you can hang out for hours. That's where you mm -hmm. know you get the familiar foods. But I would definitely say it's much more. Oh, one thing I never understand, and I don't know what this is white sauce in Afghan restaurants. Like, I don't know what that is. You know, and everyone's always asking me for, yes, Queen's Night Market. Everyone's always asking me for like a white sauce recipes from mm -hmm. um, uh, from Afghanistan. I'm like, I don't know. But it looks like it tastes like mayonnaise or something. They put it on top of the kebabs. I think it may be. I think um, it's from the cart, cart food. It is cart food. I think it has more of a shelf life than say chaka, which would be like a labna kind mm -hmm. of thing so I think it's just an easy way of skirting so there are things like that that are invented and made and mm -hmm. and that's part of you know migration food that migrates and cultures you reinvent food sure. as well sure sure uh we're coming towards the end so I'm going to ask you for all our uh you know connoisseurs of food here uh <laughs> guessing along play you know play, uh, no who seem to know a lot of these ingredients um if if one wants to learn Afghan cooking, and I'm going to say Afghan just as broadly as you wish. Let's talk about three things and give give me your why one must learn this and how to make it quickly. Non, Afghani non. So oh, make, yeah, no, you have to Zora, make the non. It's very hard. It's very hard. No, it's easy. I'll tell you. I'll teach you. <laughs> we'll we'll do a training session. Exactly. Um, but you just need a cookie sheet to do it. You don't need one of those things. Mm -hmm. um, then I would say palau. Right, you want a mm -hmm. hearty palau rice dish at the center. Usually, it's a Sunday dish for us, mm -hmm. um, and then a korma, which is like a gush korma, which is, or a palak sabzi. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like with spinach and rhubarbs and things. So there's always a nice contrast. Or I can't tell if the zingi comes from the jalalabadi cooking we mostly do, or but kabuli food as well is like that. Mm -hmm. um, those are the two areas that I'm most familiar with. But um, yeah, so I would say korma and then palau and mm -hmm. then naan. I think that's it. That's and cool. what's the what's the kind of uh, baseline uh, korma recipe? Well, you um, well you could usually it's it's a it's a meat centered culture, so uh, it'll be lamb um, korma, mm -hmm. and then yeah. you'll have you know maybe kofta as a separate one. But what do you mean base? Like you want the ingredients? No, like like uh, the actual base is onions and garlic. And yes, that's what I'm tomato. Asking. Yeah, because uh, because uh, korma within the kind of Mughlai Indian um, scene is uh, often like cashew nut or. Uh, paste of almond or cashew and things ah, like that. So kawarma, korma comes from the word kawarma, which means ah, okay. the saute. So anything that's sauteed is a kawarma. Shawarma okay. is something that is cooked where the water comes out mm -hmm. or something like that. And then uh, there's kawarma, shawarma. There's a whole list. I forgot what they are, but my something my dad <laughs> taught me. But the ma, yeah. the ma at the end is important. Shawarma, kawarma, something mm -hmm. ma. Um, I see. So, yeah, so it's onion. The saute is what's important and the tomato. So 
that mm-hmm. you put in after. So onion, garlic, tomato. You okay. simmer it down and you would add the meat or you add the meat during the onions, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Oh, I see. Okay, thanks. That's what uh, makes sense. Right, right, right. Yeah, I have a very specific understanding of korma with the K as it's spelled. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to bring our conversation to an end, and we should do probably something longer and talk more. Uh, Zora is organizing uh, has been organizing a fundraiser, which is sponsoring an Afghan writer, a teacher, and a family of twelve members, and it's being uh, done by uh, humanitarian uh, parole. Uh, so oh. please, here is a link, and I'm going to. Uh, I hope people can contribute to this fund. Uh, I think uh, you've been uh, working quite hard on it, right? And I think oh, it's yeah. is it looking optimistic, or how are you feeling? Well, I think that we probably need to put a lot more pressure. I don't think the Biden administration has been doing much for Afghans. I don't think they dealt with the evacuation well well at all. Pulling out military and leaving vulnerable people behind may not have been the best way of handling it. And then the airport situation and the chaos. So State Department has not been as helpful. Administration has not been helpful. So there's been a big push to get the U.S. government involved because they are responsible for most of, most of these are USAID trained. So they're marked for that training. Mm-hmm. Um, they received funding in other forms from the U.S. So uh, these are people quite vulnerable right now. So yeah, sorry, that was our that was a um, the screen share act, acting up. That's Annie Gall and Anasa Tassi, and they're going to be talking about um, this book, Sumak. Uh, also, great. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank excited. you so yeah, thank you so much, uh, Zora. This thank was uh, incredible. Thank you for teaching. Thank you for telling us so much. And I'll be in touch with you again. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Bhakti. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Um, and a finale uh, here, our last a pre-recorded uh, conversation with Annie Gol uh, and um, Anas Itasi. Atasi. Uh, I am going to play it here. And thank you so much to everyone who has joined. Uh, don't leave just yet. Another 30 minutes uh, before we finish our extravaganza of uh, food everyone, and thank you for joining us for this Radical Books Collective event, Gastropolitics, Gastropoetics. My name is Annie Gall. I'm based at the University of Maryland in the United States, where I teach and write about literature, cookbooks, and food in the Arabic-speaking world. And I'm thrilled today to be interviewing Anas Atasi, who's the author of Sumac, Recipes and Stories from Syria, published by Interlink Books. Anas currently lives in Amsterdam, He was born in Homs, Syria, and every summer his whole family went back to Homs to be together and celebrate the season. Good food was an important part of that celebration, and Anas has remained a lover of Syrian cuisine, which started his great love for cooking. Sumak is his first cookbook. So thank you so much for uh, sharing your time and and, and being here to talk about this great book. Thanks, Anya. Um, Thanks for the lovely introduction. Um, So in your introduction to the book, you say that there are two essential ingredients to Syrian cuisine. So I'd like to begin by talking about those. Um, The first one is nafas. So you write that this is an Arabic word. It means breath, literally. But you write that nafas is something you can't see or touch, but that you can taste it. And I really love that definition of it. So for people who are watching or listening and who don't know what nafas is, could you just explain briefly what that means to you? Yeah, so as you mentioned, it's literally meaning breath, which uh, is something uh, indeed like uh, it's not something tangible. And um, usually it is given as a compliment for somebody who is a really good cook, who knows how to uh, use the right ingredients at the right time during the cooking and eventually uh, turn out to be like a really special meal. And uh, and usually it's very common that uh, you would say, oh, this person has really nice nafas after you had a really good dinner at their place. And uh, and it's like really one of the biggest compliments you can, can ever give to uh, a chef or just a home cook or a mom. And, and that's like uh, uh, something that always would stay with somebody, or oh, this person has a nafas. So that is really uh, what, what, it me- what it means. And, uh, and for me, it is, as mentioned, uh, like using the right ingredients, but also uh, uh, 
uh, how to how to use those ingredients at the right season uh, and uh, within uh, the uh, uh, the recipe and eventually for example my mom i think she is uh, the best person who can use tomatoes in her cooking because she really knows what are the right type of tomatoes for what type of dish it is but then how long you need to cook it with in order to get this really deep flavor of a tomato that just any other person who can use the same tomato can never get this taste of a tomato that my mom makes and that's really because she has a great nafas yeah i think it's nafas is such a rich concept in the world of arab cooking and as you point out it's not just something that professional chefs have but is really associated with home cooks and what you eat in the home and what you make for the people around you um and I, I think the fact that you begin your book with nafas really speaks to the transformative potential of a book like this, that it's more than just a list of ingredients and recipes, that there's a lot more going on in this book, um, and that perhaps that's more than the sum of its parts and can kind of read, lead the reader to find their own nafas. I think that is a really great way to, to open the book. Um, the other essential ingredient that you talk about is, of course, sumac, which is where the title comes from and that is something that we can very much see and taste it's this deep brilliant red spice um really strong kind of tart bright flavor um so you call it the red thread that connects everything throughout the book and so i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you came to that or how you came to sumac and nafas are these two things that you knew from the beginning would kind of be the foundation or was it through collecting the recipes that these two themes or ingredients kind of came to you as, as the two most important ones? Uh, it, I think that's a really good question. And uh, this is something indeed, not something that I already thought of from the beginning. It's indeed something like more, uh, I did research, talked to people and uh, reflected on my memories and uh, on uh, my childhood and uh, my mom's cooking and my grandma's cooking. And th this is like really how it evolved. And for me, sumac, personally, I have very uh, strong memories of sumac. Uh, we, uh, at a certain time, we used to live in uh, Saudi Arabia where my parents used to, to work and live. And uh, my, I remember my mom every summer when we go there for like three months in Syria, she would come back with like kilos of sumac bringing in from Syria to, uh, to, uh, to Saudi in order to use it uh, in, in her everyday cooking. And although we lived outside of Syria for some time, but like it, our house was always a Syrian feast and Syrian celebration of the culture and the food. And, uh, and sumac was always part of it. And what I personally like about sumac and it's, I think, very um, says a lot about uh, uh, the Syrian cooking, where it is used uh, um, as a as a as an ingredient, which is a substitute of something which is tangy or lemony, mm -hmm. which is could be for lemon, and and that's where a lot of Syrian. Uh, in the old time, they used to preserve or use alternatives in order to make sure that some of the ingredients that are not available in the season are actually substituted with something else that can be uh, stored for a long time. And that's like uh, the old days in the Syrian, uh, uh, Syrian homes uh, and houses of people, they would really store those ingredients within like a really cold place a bit uh, in the shadow and store it for a long time and use it for everyday cooking. And, and for me, what I love about sumac, other than the taste, it is that the versatility of this, uh, of this uh, ingredient that can you use in, uh, uh, in salads, in soups, in uh, meat, fish, and it just uh, gives a really an elevated level to this dish. And uh, for me, I, I personally, probably people would disagree, like, oh, why sumac? But for me, that's, it's personal. And uh, it, it says a lot about uh, Syrian cooking. But also, uh, it is uh, really common, mainly common in, in our region, in the Levant area, in, the, uh, in Iran, and not very common outside of this area, which also gives it a bit of more special uh like uh, uh like type of ingredient compared to the black pepper or to the to the very common in many other cuisines so that's also gives it a bit more special place uh in my memory yeah i appreciate how it's it's this sort of has this versatility 
but also, as you say, is very particular to a, a specific region and it's, it's cooking. And I like to, it's how you talk about the sort of what people did to bring that tartness or that tanginess to food before. I mean, today we can get lemons any time of year, but that wasn't always the case. And this is something that comes up sometimes when I, when I'm teaching historical recipes, sometimes they'll use vinegar and students will say, well, why is there vinegar in the hummus? And I'll have to tell them, you know, we just take lemons for granted. Um, but then the idea that sumac is something that preserves that kind of flavor year round and is still very much present in the cooking today. It's kind of a thread that connects the past of Syrian cuisine to its present as well. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, really yeah. nice uh, way you said it. I, I haven't really also like- <laughs> I hadn't uh, thought of it before until you said so. Um, so yeah, I like that. And so did, like, how did you decide that Sumac would be the title of the book? Yeah, I think it's really because uh, this personal connection that I have uh, of, of Summa and the, the memories I have it with the, how mom, she always like sorts in the markets for the best Summa and like mm -hmm. transport it and uh, we use it a lot and my mom used it a lot in her, in her kitchen. Uh, so that's really uh, this personal connection because the book is somehow personal uh, with personal stories and I really wanted to keep it this way but mm -hmm. although it's personal like many Syrians within uh, 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 inside of Syria now or outside of Syria can really connect to those stories and uh, because everybody in Syria goes to their grandmother for breakfast on Friday uninvited they go there no question like that's like every Syrian has relatively more or less the same stories um, uh, as the book so this is like the per more personal but something that can relate that can people also relate to yeah so that kind of leads to my next question, which is that this book has a, as you say, there's a lot of personal touches, but there's also a very clear vision. Uh, you present um, Syria as a place where life is to be cherished and celebrated, as you put it. And in conveying this sense of what Syria is, the book doesn't only present recipes, but it gives them so much context with stories about breakfast with your grandmother um, or different visuals and objects and images that um, kind of convey this cherishing and celebration of life. Um, so I often use cookbooks in the classroom as part of my teaching because they can be such rich texts in that way. But I also remind students that cookbooks are commercial objects, um, that often publishers have very strong ideas about what a cookbook should include or what it should look like. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it was like finding a publisher, working with publishers to transform your vision for this book and sort of how you present Syria in this book into a physical cookbook and what that, what that was like. Yeah. Indeed, so I'm not a professional chef or even a writer and uh, I just have, uh, like uh, I, I had uh, those memories and stories that I, I'm, I was really afraid that I sometimes, like when I talk to my sister or my mom, I sometimes like, huh, like what, what did that happen? It did, like I'm trying to like somehow for, forget those stories and memories. And I wanted to uh, uh, like uh, have, have a place for it as a memoir, but also uh, like the dishes that I, I love cooking and I'm like, I, like I call myself an amateur chef to be, hopefully, but uh, but uh, like the I do find that uh, recipes by themselves I think they are great to cook them, but the context around this recipe and the story that comes around it and how to eat it and when to eat it and also some personal touches gives it so much flavor. This recipe and uh, uh, than just uh, the recipe itself. And for me, when I started writing. Uh, down those recipes, which actually started writing them before I even thought I want to write a cookbook by uh, calling mom and making sure she can give me the right recipe so I can cook it at home. And I started collecting some of uh, the recipes uh, that she uh, uh, that she gave me. And eventually I had this idea of doing a cookbook. And um, and I, I had like some really, but we were very fortunate to connect with a creative director who had very similar type of books that did it in the Netherlands that eventually uh, also uh, published a really amazing book. So I 
got in contact with her and I told her this is my uh, story and this is the recipes I have in mind and I would really love to have something that doesn't just uh, like uh, it's not just a cookbook I just I want it to be a little bit more than a cookbook that is very like uh, personal but at the same time uh, gives a lot of uh, context of the Syrian culture and the Syrian food and uh, she was like I love this I'm gonna help you all the way to find the right publisher to find uh, the uh, uh, to, to, to put it all together in order to uh, to have this uh, this I think amazing product that I find it's not only my product it's a product of a team that did a lot of amazing job to put it together which includes not only the people directly with the photography and the uh, creative vision of it but also my mom, my auntie, my grandmother, who contributed a lot to this book that eventually brought it to where it is. And the publisher really loved the idea and, uh, and, uh, and it, they found it quite uh, unique, but not a lot of those Syrian cookbooks that are really available with a personal touch um, that gives this context, but also delicious recipes. So that was really how it, uh, it came along. Yeah, it's true. It really it stands out as as a unique kind of cookbook, and and the recipes are. I've cooked many of them, and they are excellent. So, if anyone is looking for delicious recipes, it offers that as as well as so much more than that. Uh, so, I want to go back to. I mean, you point to the your mom's recipes and your grandmother's recipes are really kind of the soul of this book. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your learning process. Like it's very different to grow up with dishes and to know them as opposed to then trying to make them yourself or yeah. even translating them into a recipe format with exact amounts of ingredients and timings. And I mean, that's quite a process of transformation. So uh, you mentioned, I think that sometimes you would send your mom images of dishes and yeah. she would give you feedback. So I just love to hear a little bit more about like, the learning process of of uh, learning to make and then share these recipes in that way. Yeah, so growing up at my mom's uh, or my family house, I, I really didn't cook any meal from beginning to end. I would always help my mom chopping some parsley or like uh, some uh, onion or garlic. That's mainly my specialty in, <laughs> at my mom's house. But then being part of this environment of uh, uh, that kind of uh, made me like somehow unconsciously love this food like uh, and, and the process of making this food and when i left my family house uh, you can have and i lived started living and work and studying in, uh, in lebanon and um, and then at that time like i did you can easily find hummus you can easily find the fatouche and those recipes in in the rest in restaurants but uh, there are some of those home cozy dishes that you can never find in a restaurant even in syria or in lebanon those are the really the mom my mom's cook cooking and recipes and that and i really miss those recipes and that was the time when i was like okay i i'm really craving musabbaha or i'm really craving the spinach uh, uh, dish and uh, was like uh, every day or every now and then i would call my mom and like okay mom i do want to do this like are you sure like you you are you have never done this before like no i want to eat it and i know how to i would know how to do it so like uh, skype and pictures and uh, phone calls and like every now and then and she would love the process of, of teaching me and uh, giving those recipes to me and uh, sometimes would argue oh by the way i did it differently today i did this and that like no you shouldn't do this like no but it turned out to be really good so it's like uh, give and take and uh, and that the process was really great and this process is continuous every day or every now and then i would always learn something and we talk about it we send each other now instagram food accounts and sharing uh, the food uh, passion that we have and that, I, mean, I think that really comes across in the book that this is not just a set of sort of static, um, stuck in time, singular recipes, but there's kind of a dynamic to it that there are certain dishes that you add a twist to or change a little bit and that it's part of a con sort of a conversation, like a living uh, process um, and yeah. not just set in stone, like one way to do something. 
I think so. I, like people argue, like you no, know, the recipes needs to be really exactly the same how your mom gave it to you, and she never change it. For me, I have a different way of cooking, and also within the book, like I do encourage people to like put more spice if they like more spicy food, and to put more uh, 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 tanginess or citrusy to, if they do like it, and uh, and uh, also some uh, options to substitute some ingredients if they're not possibly available in, in their market or in the region. So I think it is, uh, I think Syrian cooking is, is not uh, indeed uh, static. It's like, can uh, you, you do it using the right ingredients and using the nafas and, uh, and all this together and uh, your liking if it makes a great uh, Syrian dish. Yeah. Um, so your book uses, uh, as we've been talking about, not just food, but stories and images to present several different perspectives on sort of what Syria is and, uh, different ways of understanding Syria. So I'd love to talk about a couple of those different perspectives that come through, um, starting with the chapter on street food. So this chapter begins, uh, with a story that's not just about food, but about freedom. You describe the summers that you spent in homes by saying they were lived as one moment of freedom followed by another. And it was a kind of freedom you didn't have elsewhere or any other time of year. Um, and I really appreciated how a big part of that wasn't just freedom from something, uh, but freedom to explore different foods and eat things that maybe weren't prepared in the home and sort of wander the streets with friends and cousins in search of delicious new street foods. Um, so could you talk a little bit about why it was important to include that perspective, like as well as these home cooked meals, but you also have these street foods included in the book as well, and what it was like finding recipes for those. Absolutely, because uh, like uh, many of the street foods that are like created in the book are usually not something that a, a mom or a home would do falafel or they do, wouldn't do shawarma. It's like really rare. It's like uh, there is always this person within the neighborhood that is known with with his name, and uh, and this like whenever we want to have, for example, shawarma, oh, we go to Abu Abdo to get a shawarma, and and this and there's somehow like uh, untalked about relationship that we always have with those street vendors, and uh, also they know us, and it is like a like this uh, uh, relationship of uh, of food that. Kind of develops between uh, between uh, home uh, cooks and also uh, street vendors and uh, and for that reason I think they they and uh, and those the food they they cook is like one of the most uh, loved food like shawarma falafel and maali those are like people love those food and has a lot of memories to uh, uh, different type of memories to uh, to, to, to Syrian people. And I think that is why, and I love it personally, the the uh, the, uh, the Syrian uh, street uh, cooking, and uh, yeah, I, th I thought that this would be a really nice kind of different perspective of home cooking that can really gives also a different dimension and perspective of what Syrian food and Syrian culture would uh, 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 is for for a, a typical person living in, in Syria. Yeah. Was, it, was it difficult to adapt those recipes for home cooking? Absolutely, because uh, uh, first of all, uh, whatever good relationship you have with the street vendor, like merchant, they would never give you the recipe. It's like <laughs> not possible. Like the shawarma, per, uh, like recipe for one, uh, it's like sacred and like locked with twenty five probably locks that nobody can reach. And uh, and uh, and that's what and this is what they're proud of, and uh, they try to give you tips here and there, and uh, but not the full recipe, uh, and uh, uh, and the, trying to find the right taste that I personally like and adjusting it, and uh, uh, it's, it was a was an experience and the research that I have done online, but also tasting several uh, uh, dishes uh, of the same. Uh, of the same recipe within the uh, uh, within the Syrian market until I like, really found the right balance that I 
personally like, but also mm-hmm. like what, it, what my mom would also approve of. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of factors to balance. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, the book really, it's not just confined to one's fear, but kind of takes us into homes as well as uh, into the street. And like, that's a place of, of community and memory as well. Um, your book is, of course, very rooted in these Syrian places, but it also takes us to Amsterdam and you give us a sense of what it means for you to cook Syrian food for your community and your friends there. And you explain that feeding your community Syrian style, the way that your mother and grandmother have taught you, um, doesn't always mean just recreating the same dishes that you had in Syria, but you talk about maybe adding Syrian spices to a Dutch pea soup. Um, or making a dish with bulgur that's inspired by a friend's dirty rice recipe. Um, so this kind of, I think, gets back to nafas in this question of what really makes the food Syrian is not a specific list of ingredients, but what you're conveying about the, the sort of spirit and intent behind making the food. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the more experimental dishes and why it was important for you to include them and maybe give an example? and yeah so i think uh, a really good example is the uh, the uh, uh, the dirty rice and uh, i i did have a dirty rice in uh, uh, in one of uh, my friends uh, house and in uh, the netherlands and it was uh, a recipe that has been inspired by somebody's uh, mom and i absolutely loved it and it was like okay there is uh, turmeric there is black pepper there is cumin so i did feel those ingredients that are very like uh, very uh, um, known and uh, uh, to, to me and uh, and uh, wanted to like recreate something different but with like uh, a, an ingredient which is bulgur which is very common in Syrian cooking and uh, fusing those together to to uh, to get like uh, uh, something which is closer to home with using uh, multiple ingredients within a market within the my the market within my vicinity that can actually make prepare this in an easy way and uh, that kind of was like a was an experiment can kind of say but uh, but also something that uh, also was very appreciated by by my friends when i cooked for them and uh, and what do you say to what to, to what you have said is like it is more uh, the nafas, which is like how you present the food and how you invite the people and the, the generosity and the type of sharing setting that all together really makes a Syrian who uh, like uh, a Syrian meal. So that was really the uh, the inspiration of like, okay, what are the ingredients that we can have within our market, but then what uh, ingredients that are close to my heart and to home and like trying to fuse those together and put them in a Syrian setting with uh, with a Syrian, you know, on a Syrian table with a Syrian kind of way of cooking and sharing food together. And that's what kind of uh, makes, as you said, like any dish with the right ingredients and setting a Syrian feast. Yeah, it's really striking how you sort of distill and demonstrate how the nafas works to create something of Syria in a place like Amsterdam. Oh. Um, so we have time for about one more question, and I want to talk about the incredible visuals. There's not just images of food here, but the everything in the images, the tablecloths, the dishes are also a part of recreating a kind of Syrian world in the book. Uh, and it also includes some really striking photographs of Damascus uh, that appear throughout. Um, so they were taken by a Syrian photographer, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about those photographs and the photographer and how you selected them for the book yeah so uh, indeed the uh, photographer of uh, the uh, the images of the damascus are by rania uh, and uh, rania is a friend of mine and we actually studied together in this in uh, the same university in lebanon and she's syrian and eventually she went back to syria and to damascus to live there and that was during the time when the really war started to uh, uh, to uh, started and uh, became more serious and uh, and she wanted at that time to kind of uh, uh, document the the buildings document the culture document the 
uh, the architect of uh, and and the and the uh, and the, the the life as we know it in Damascus and in Syria. So she started taking those photos mainly in street markets and uh, uh, old houses and uh, uh, and like the souks uh, of uh, the food uh, the food stocks and the food uh, street street food. So that was like really her. Um, her own project and uh, and i always i follow her on uh, on social media and uh, i would uh, and uh, i like had the idea to include those some kind of photos that bring this atmosphere and uh, to to the book and she was the first one that came to my mind to kind of bring this uh, and add have a beautiful addition to the book and i think as you said it really adds uh, a really beautiful kind of uh, feeling and uh, and more sense of uh, of uh, uh, like um, tangible, like more tangible. The those recipes comes more to life when you see those images of uh, of Damascus. And uh, so I was very happy that she actually she agreed, and she was absolutely like loved the idea. And she said I would love to be part of it. So she brought me those uh, uh, and we took uh, those images that she took. But also you mentioned some other photos and. Uh, uh, tablecloth and potteries that were part of the book and that was like really a collaboration of uh, of family members from from Syria or Saudi or even my auntie living in Germany that she has collected those amazing uh, Arabani tablecloths and uh, I started collecting those from here and there and they, everybody was so enthusiastic about the idea of like like how amazing is this project that we that they were actually genuinely wanted to help and bring some of the dishes and uh, many of those also plates within the book are actually plates from my grandmother's house that were yeah. her brought uh, through somebody who we know who was going out of Syria and coming to Europe and then me trying to collect it from wherever they are in Europe. And that was like really the process of selecting and putting those um, potteries and tablecloths and uh, forks and knives even coming from Syria. Wow. Yeah, it was yeah. really try to make it as special and personal and real as possible. Yeah. One of my favorite scholars, Nadia Saramatakis, says that there's something about sensory experience that is a kind of poetics, like it can create something that words can't always create. And I think that really comes through in this book that it's more than just the text, but it's these, you get this sense of a whole material world, whether it's these images of Damascus or those that's incredible that you have dishes and forks and utensils and uh, mm -hmm. linens, tablecloths from from your family's experience that are sort of gathered all together in this book. Um, so I think that's a good place to kind of finish our, our conversation. Um, thank you so much for your time, Anas, and for this wonderful book. Uh, the book is called Sumac Recipes and Stories from Syria, and it's published in the US by Interlink Press. Um, and you can find Anas on Instagram at Anas Atassi. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Thanks, Annie, for the lovely chat. Appreciate it. Thanks.